Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 220. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge on the Comic Forums, and I'm joined as always by co-host Jim, saving Jason Todd as my personal crusade, or I may just be afraid of my body parts winding up in a tote bag. So says the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, and the Duke of you know. How's it going, eh? (laughs) Jim, this episode we're going to talk about Batman Under the Red Hood, the film. Not only that, though, we really have an in-depth look at the history of Jason Todd, uh, the concept of Robin in general, and how hard it was to initially replace Dick Grayson, our feelings about where this character went throughout his history. It's it's really kind of a fun, all-encompassing episode, talking about death in the family, what the Batman mythos was like when that was originally released, to present day, and how much... Going back to this story and really pulling from that was something that was unique. So I think it's a really encompassing look at this film and just the whole concept and comics that led to it. It was really deep. Then we're joined by Daryl Taylor and Jamie Dunst, and it's a fun roundtable discussion on this one, which is cool. Our sponsors for this episode are DCB Service and InSockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, you can pick up Batman Hidden Treasures Number 1, written by Ron Mars and Len Wein, art by Bernie Wrightson and Kevin Nolan, with a cover by Bernie Wrightson. At long last, the legendary Lost Bernie Wrightson story starring The Dark Knight comes to life. Written by Ron Mars from Green Lantern and inked by Kevin Nolan's Superman vs. Aliens and Doctor Strange, this astonishing Batman Solomon Grundy story features full-page illustrations on every page. Also included in this can't-miss issue is the newly colored classic Bernie Wrights and Len Wein Batman story, Night of the Bat, which originally appeared in Swamp Thing No. 7. Both stories featured colors by the acclaimed artist... Alex Sinclair from Batman Hush and 52, and both present particularly startling looks at the Cape Crusader, as only Wrightson could present. It's regularly $4.99, 40% off only $2.99, so that's great if you know, you're on the fence about grabbing that story, you can get it at a 40% off discount and get it at a great price. Is that something, Jim, you're looking at picking up? Oh yeah, yeah, that's definitely in the order. Because it's, kind of, it's amazing. I was looking at the amount of Batman material that's going to be coming out. And this, this is the return month that we're ordering for right now, where some of the Batman titles aren't being published this month, but some of them are. And uh, I'm anxious to pick up that story because it's a nice classic coming in. And Bernie Wrightson's one of those artists that uh, his Batman is just one of those, oof, that's stellar and stunning. So I'm, yeah, it's, yeah, it's funny because with all the return stuff and all that, I was... I I will admit I was a little hesitant, and then I started reading just the little clip on it, and that kind of just had me... uh, I'm very curious about some of the older Batman stuff, some of the the, the quote-unquote lost stories that are coming out, and just seeing this kind of like another glimpse at Batman in a different time. We're talking a lot of Batman this month, actually, because over at InStockTrades.com, the cult trade paperback, that's going to be wrapping up this month with... And it's J- that's Jim Starlin and Bernie Wrightson from mm-hmm. 1989. And that's regularly $19.99, 47% off, only ten fifty nine. But we've got a couple episodes that are planned prior to that, and we're going to wrap up the month with that one. I'm really excited to talk about it, because I just actually finished this morning reading it again, so I could get my notes all finalized and ready to go for that discussion. And it is interesting to see Wrightson's style on uh, his Batman. I really love the look that he gives this character. There's something very powerful about him in in the Wrightson version, and, and there's a supernatural look, which I always liked. It's uh, something I liked when Kelly Jones was on Batman as well, was that supernatural kind of look and feel to uh, the the whole Batman, and I'm really excited to see what this is going to be, this new miniseries that they just announced is going to be like. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. Jim, we are going to be at the New York Comic Con, October 8th to the 10th, and it's just kind of a quick little precursor to it, but that's uh, nycomiccon.com, and I'm really excited that we're going to be once again in the podcast arena. Okay, I won't go the full full song this time. As we mentioned in Chicago, (laughs) we're looking for somebody who's either going to be there the whole weekend... Or if you can't be there the whole weekend, you wouldn't mind on the day that you're going to stop by our table and fill in for us for a little bit. We did, it's not like for an extensive thing. Just in case the two of us need to hit a panel or something together, uh, somebody who would like to get into the convention for free. 
Jim and I are going to buy a ticket for a listener who would like to do that. So uh, please consider emailing us at ragingbullets at gmail.com, and we'd love to have you uh, come on the podcast and also to help us out at the table if you're interested. So kind of a free way to get into the New York Comic Con. But let us know as soon as possible because uh, that was fun last time. We had Greg and Dan help us out last time, and we're certainly looking for people to help us out this time. Jim, what kind of a podcast are we? Well, Sean, we are a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth in the plotline, story twists, and whatnot of the DVD and and or comics we are reviewing in this show. So if we're going over something you haven't read and or watched, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Our first review this episode is going to be of Batman Under the Red Hood, the DVD release. And joining us are friends of the show Daryl Taylor and Jamie Dunst. And guys, welcome to Raging Bullets. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me too. Now guys, obviously the first thing we should probably kick off discussing is what were your feelings about this? And Jamie, I'll go to you first. How did you feel about this DVD release? I was looking forward to it. I mean, I've been watching all of the directed DVD videos for DC. I thought... Each one has gotten better as they come up, as they come out, and um, I was really glad to see them going back to their. I think their original thought process was to do stories based on you know on actual stories in the comics. So I was really excited to see this turn into a a video, and then as I saw more of it come out, you know, like sneak peeks here and there, I got really jazzed and. You know, the the actual video is just amazing. Well, I was looking forward to it because I, I like the original story, the uh, the comic version with uh, Winnick. And I liked it that much that I was excited when they uh, announced it. So and then they showed the uh, little clips before it came out and, it, and the animation looked really good. So I could not wait to, to run and, and buy it. And as soon as I got it, I came home and threw it in. The, I was so tired that I threw it in even though I was exhausted and tried to like watch it and fell asleep on like halfway through woke up like three in the morning and finished watching the rest of it (laughs) Jim oh god this was a I was excited for it and then just because the story I loved and then you hear Winnix actually doing it and you start getting little news clips and you know about how he actually had to pitch it, and he went through the whole idea how he could make it work. And just, you know, when you hear him talking how excited he was about doing this, that just had it on a level for me going, oh, yes. And then as soon as I started watching, you talk about just how the uh, the graphics, I just, the, it was such a comfortable, it, there was nothing jarring on the appearance. It was, you know, what I was used to seeing for the for the animated series. It was just this great story that, you know, it, it was what I imagined, what I wanted. This was something that I... It's it's hard to say that this is my favorite one because each one has their different, you know, their different feels and their different vibes to them. But if I really was, like, pushed to, say, pick one and say that's your favorite, this one right now would probably be that favorite for me because it just felt so right visually and story-wise. Do you think it's because it's the most recent or do you think it's because of the fact that it uh, nailed the story so well? I'm not saying I'm not saying you're right or wrong there. I'm just kind of curious. On one hand, I'm thinking it is because of it's you know the most recent thing. But then I went back and watched a couple of the other ones again just to make sure, like you know. And while I love the other stuff, and I really I was like, yeah, this is so cool. I was enjoying what I was seeing the other stuff. There was something about Under the Hood when I watched it again. I was like, you know, it just it just feels right. It just something. It was like. It was a comfort of the story, but also a comfort of visual stuff. And it was a, a great just blend of, there's a lot of just action sequences and moments. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. My wife and I watched it together. And I think the the, the Jonah Hex one, I think, definitely disturbed her. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this, this story, it, I didn't realize till I was watching it how dark this story would be for somebody who doesn't regularly read comics. And she, she really enjoyed it. But I could tell there was a, like, wow. Because it really is for somebody whose exposure to Batman would be more of a television version of Batman. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be used to seeing something this dark. Because this is really Dark Knight dark. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I saw anything this dark. And maybe except, with the exception of maybe the Wonder Woman with, like, you know, even with the Wonder Woman, there were, like, beheadings, but they were, like, silhouetted, so there was no blood to it. Mm -hmm. Right. But with, even with... Going back to like the whole was is my favorite. I, I, story wise, and I think just art wise, it 
it was my favorite. I, I watched this now maybe five times, and I could watch it again because I, I don't think I'll I can get tired of it. Like I watched other the other ones, and you know they're great. And I just think with each movie, Dave maybe learn something from the last movie they did and they just continue to improve. So I can only imagine what the next one and the one after that's going to be like if they continue doing what they're doing because uh, one of the things DC is doing well, I think, is these direct-to-DVDs stories. And this one was just, I think, there's very little I could say about it that, that wasn't just outstanding. And I do think they've gotten into a formula now I don't mean that in a way that it's cookie cutter, where I think they've the putting these shorts in, you know, where they're like spotlighting on a certain character that seem to they have these stories that really fit into these these short segments that uh, are seem to be working. Like Jonah Hex, I thought was really good. I really oh, yeah. liked the Spectre in the last one. I think those are are really neat. It's a it's a different way to showcase some characters that couldn't maybe that couldn't sell their own full release. But it's a great way to expose people to those characters. But then uh, I do feel that that formula of doing that and then doing... It actually goes back to what was... Because cla- films used to have shorts before yeah. them. It's something Pixar mm-hmm. explores all the time. And I love the way Pixar does it. So it really is, I think, borrowing from classic film. The fact that you would always... Because if you yeah. looked at, I think, like the old Disney shorts, those were the... they were, uh-huh. Old Disney shorts were, you, were something that were pegged on before a movie. Like the... Like classic Mickey Mouse cartoons. I, I'm just reading it's Superman, and they have a whole thing about it being. I think it was in the 30s, and they talk about how they have like the new segments, and they have a cartoon, and then they show the movie. This is sort of it feels sort of like that. Talking about our exposure to stories, because you mentioned something before, Jamie, that's kind of interesting to me. What is? And I'm start with you, Daryl, and we can kind of go around and talk about this. What is your exposure to the stories that are contained within this? Because there really are two stories that are represented here, to a limited extent, death in the family, and then, you know, to obviously under the red hood or under the hood is the other story. Daryl, what is your exposure to that? I I know I'm almost positive the answer is that you read Death in the Family as it was coming out, but... uh, Yeah, yeah, I read... uh, Because I, you know, I I was into Batman, you know, before that. So I read all of Death in the Family. I read all those stories of Bruce. Because they were pretty much... uh, It was a long period of time of Bruce mourning the loss of Jason. Like, that was a a character beat that they kept in the storylines after that was done up until under the red hood i mean that was just you know the glass uh, case with the the uh costume like every now and then he would see that you know and then there was a there was a time when batman was he got a lot darker and he refused to uh take on a partner and you know just that whole thing and tim pushing his way in all of that stuff it it was something just I think that's why the movie affected me more than the other one. Like, I liked all of the animated um, movies that they've done so far, but this one, I think, touched touched me more than the others because it really captured all the emotional beats from, you know, Jason, how he really wanted to turn Jason into... He knew how bad, you know, he knew he had issues with anger, but he really wanted to mentor Jason like he did uh, Dick Grayson and, and he caught that it caught how, how many problems he had with him, how dangerous the Joker was because people didn't realize how bad or evil the Joker was until he did that and and I think that set the really set the tone you know in addition to what he did with Barbara I think that really set the tone on how dangerous the Joker was and how like how much rage Bruce has to deal with every time he sees the joker did you vote when i didn't even vote no i didn't vote when the, i, I wanted to but i didn't i voted i voted not to kill him i remember um i i mean i go back to jason you know pre-crisis when i felt he was more of a knockoff of he was i think he was even an acrobat they, they his yeah. history he was an acrobat pre-crisis yeah. yeah so i remember when those when that story came out I can't say I loved Jason Todd as Robin because it was he was it, I feel like he his character looking back now it was a character that never really had a chance because he went from pre crisis being too much like Dick Grayson mm-hmm. to post crisis being not enough like Dick Grayson 
And I, I felt he was very polarized. And although I read stories where I really liked him and like, uh, like the man who had everything I thought was one of the best stories I've, I've read with Jason Todd until I read uh, Batman the cult. And he just was a character. I just, I could never really hang on to, but I love the character of Robin. So when I read death in the family and I got to that, you know, that, that last chapter where they had that 900 number, I immediately called the, the Joker fails and Robin lives. And I, I didn't want Robin to die because Robin had always been my favorite character, even if it wasn't Dick Grayson, it was Jason Todd. I, I've always liked that character. His death actually kind of annoyed me just because I wanted to see what they could have done with that character going on forward. And I always wonder what he would have been like, what the book would have been like if he had lived. And uh, so I, I have read uh, Death in the Family. I actually have it in the DC Classics now, it, it, The Death in the Family. They, they, did, they re put that out with both Death in the Family and The Lonely Place of Dying, which is actually a really cool companion piece to to Death in the Family because it has a lot to do with Jason's death and Bruce not wanting a partner. And uh, I read Under the Hood back when it came out. I haven't read it since, but I, I have a very, you know, middle-of-the-road relationship with Jason Todd. And that's the way it's supposed... When you hear Judd Winnick interviewed about it, that's the relationship. Like, he was surprised how popular Jason became when Under the Hood came out, how people latched onto that character as somebody they wanted to see redeemed or to be a, a, a anti-hero. I remember, Jim, you actually yeah. were very much in the camp of that. Uh, it, it, he was shocked that that is something that came out of the character. Actually, Jim, uh, let me go to you right now. Because your, your exposure, probably out of all of us, is a little bit different to how you... I know you've read Death of the Family, mm -hmm. but you didn't read it when it came out. Oh, you no. read it later. So I read it through um, after Tim Drake started coming around. You know, with this, it, I was in college, and this new Robin was coming on the scene. I had a buddy who was a DC guy, and I was borrowing books from him and reading his stuff. And I'm like, hey, this Robin's gonna go. Oh, you gotta read. And that's when I read, you know, the whole death of uh, Jason long after, you know, everything had happened. You know, so I read the the, the birth of, of Tim Drake, and then went back and saw how Jason died. So it was weird that you know, because I I didn't have. That's the strong, you know, connection with him when I read that. And then when I read Under the Hood, when I started seeing who he was and how, I was like, oh, this is kind of a neat guy. And so it's my affection for Jason came with Under the Hood, with, you know, seeing him, you know, when he was the villain slash antihero slash whatever, you know, Jason Todd is kind of deal. You know, that's where my affection towards Jason comes from. So it's, you know, I'm completely different. And had, you know, when I read it, I actually asked myself, what would I have done? And at the time, I, I would have voted from the die just, you know, reading the story because I, I was thinking, wow, this is kind of neat. I'm glad, you know, I'm like, it's kind of neat. They killed him off. And, I, you know, and I asked myself, would I probably do it? I was like, yeah, I probably would have voted from the die because I really didn't know Jason other than his death story. It was very close, though, the vote. It was close. Mm hmm. Um, I, I think the I think the biggest problem with, with Jason was is that Dick Grayson was so ingrained in the character. I mean, he was he was Robin from like 1940 to like 80 something, and to have any character come after someone who's been that character that, in that role for so long, I just don't think he got the chance that I think Tim got later on. I think, though, it's funny when you talk about that, because I think there's distinct differences between Tim and Jason's story, and Dick's story, even. Uh, I, I think his film does a great job of showing Dick Grayson for who he is, Jason Todd for who he is. And when we talk about the film a little more in depth, I, I think these natural discussions are going to take place. But Because we're not going to talk a whole lot about Tim Drake, but I do think that's an interesting point there. If you take a look at Jason's story, it was about Bruce saving Jason, saving him from the streets, uh, you know, trying to give him the kind of life that he would never have headed down. You know, he would have become a criminal. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, on the other hand, because of what Bruce went through and, and how long he was really pushing away everybody and trying to be on his own, Tim was about saving Batman. Yeah. So yeah. I, it was, I think for us as fans, when, when it came to Tim, in a, in a way that was very different than Dick Grayson, who was all, who's always been kind of like the big brother figure or, you know, the friend or the brother, you could access him that way. Tim was more kind of the, an empowering 
figure for us as a fans because I do think the Robin character is our eyes into the Batman universe. I think we Absolutely. connect with Batman watching him. And I think that that's the interesting thing about Tim Drake is he really, in a unique way, actually all three of them are very unique, so I should say that right there. But oh, I yeah, think, absolutely. Yeah. It's sort of like with Robin, he, he's our perspective of Batman's universe. And, and it's sort of like when you watch Doctor, the new Doctor Who, uh-huh. like the companion was our view to the Doctor's universe, sort of. Yeah, no, no, that's actually, that's a great comparison, because the Doctor, a lot of times, depending on who the character is playing that, uh, playing the, I mean, who the actor is playing the Doctor and the different personalities he's had, sometimes Mm -hmm. he's a character who you're meant to look at as otherworldly. Other Doctors have been more, you know, accessible. I actually like that about the character, is that sometimes he feels so alien that you need to latch onto him through his human companions, and that's, and Batman's that way as well, because... One of the, there were two camps during this whole Jason Todd thing when Death and the Family happened. There was a camp that very much wanted Robin to be with Batman, which is why they went to a new Robin. Mm-hmm. And there was another camp who adamantly wanted Batman in solo stories. And that was really what the big battle was. Does he need a Robin? Or, you know, is the fan base want him to go back to some of to his original roots of being alone? And it's it's interesting to see how that like I think today with the number of books that there are, we get we we get both dynamics mm-hmm. right very mm-hmm. comfortably. But back then, you really didn't as much. No, and you it, only had uh, the the detective and Batman, and so it wasn't really if Robin wasn't there, it was just Batman stories. Whereas, and, you know, and they slowly developed Tim. Like Tim didn't come into it already being a uh, um, like an acrobat or somebody an athlete. Tim was just a smart kid, like, you know, and he you got to see through his eyes. He figured out, you know, what was going on. And then when he helped uh, Bruce kind of like deal with what he's, you know, because he really didn't want to deal with what had happened to him. That then he started to train Tim, but Tim had to earn every single thing and, you know, every single chance that he got. He had to earn it slowly, like they didn't just put him in the story. He wasn't just automatically robbing. He had to go through a lot of a trial by fire. Even when when he got into a solo um, book, he had to go through all this training. And you always got to hear what he felt um, when Chuck Dixon wrote him. You always got to know what he was thinking. So you got to feel what he was feeling and all this crazy stuff was going on. You got to experience with with him. And I think that's why so many people liked him so much more now than than with Jason. You really didn't have that chance with him. Yeah, you know, I just recently went back and I reread the, I think it was one of the I forget what Batman issue it was, but it had it was Tim's first night out on the town and it had a picture of him and Robin so it said Batman and Robin and it was just seeing Tim go throughout the first night in Gotham and you know, meeting Commissioner Gordon for the first time and, you know, his trial and error sort of way of doing things. And you you got much more internalized with Tim. And I think that you know, was the writer in a way that I don't think he ever did enough with Jason. I think a lot of the internal stuff was, was Bruce talking about Jason. Jim, what about you? What are your thoughts? Well, the one thing that I always thought was cool about Tim was the fact that I always felt that at any given time, he even felt this, that if he makes one mistake, he'll take it away from him. So he always had to be on his A game. He always had to have that, he always had that, you know, that added pressure. And I thought that seeing him deal with that pressure was something I always really liked about him as a person. So I immediately understood and I felt for the person behind the mask. It wasn't about Robin. It was about, I wanted to see Tim succeed. When I think of unlikable Robins... You know, I mean, and that's what Jason's problem was. Early on, he was unlikable. And I, I think he developed into a more likable character in certain stories. Uh, Jamie mentioned the cult before, which is definitely a story where he was uh, a very likable Robin. But I think about, like, Damien, who was a great example of somebody who I thought started out as a very unlikable Robin, but then yes. I grew to like him. My question is, Damien did this in a much shorter time frame that he was able to kind of 
turn into this Robin. And maybe you guys, I don't know, if, do you guys all like Damien now? I do. I mean, yeah. I, I, I also find it, it, it's a bit different with, with, with Damien and Jason. Because like I said before, with Jason, I think my problem with J- Jason in the beginning was he was too much like Dick Grayson to the fact that even his background as an acrobat was like, okay, can you think of something different? And then as post-crisis, he was like, oh, this guy's just a punk. How did he become Robin? With, with Damien, Damien just had a really messed up childhood. I mean, you, you, you're, you're born, you know, and raised up with, with the League of Assassins. I mean, and no one's childhood is going to be that, you know, that great when, when, you're, when you're being, you know, trained by them growing up as a, as a kid. And I think quickly, though, the character became someone that I guess I wouldn't say more likable, but he just became more tolerable. And, and just his – even his, his annoying aspects were kind of humorous. Like I find him almost comic relief in certain in, – in like, in like a non-comical way. Like he's, he's trying to be serious, but it's almost funny that he's trying to be so serious in, in this role. Sometimes. Well, it's also, I think what we've learned about Damien that has made him endearing is we've learned a lot of those things that he does are external versus internal. We've seen some of his vulnerabilities, especially when it comes to the role of Robin and how this has given him a sense of belonging. Um, That character has grown in a way where we've seen a different layer to him than what we've seen in his introductory appearances. I guess the, the reason why I even mentioned Damien, my question would have been, there were two votes. It was Jason live, Jason die. If the vote had gone the other way, Jason lived, which could which should only been a few votes, do you think that character could have eventually developed into a likable character? Or do you think he was ultimately doomed to kind of head down this path where people just didn't care for him and he was just hard to reach? Uh, because I do think this movie captured, at the essence and at the core, Jason's character. I don't think he's that far of a stretch from the character that he was when he was under Batman's care. It, it looks like a predestined path. I mean, obviously, it would be interesting to go back and see like what that conclusion would have looked like and maybe where writers would have taken him beyond there. But I don't... Do you think he could have become as likable as a, a Tim Drake, for example? I don't think so. I don't think... Because he was brought in... like. When they had him, they like they were they knew that they had to take Dick Grayson out and and push him into the Nightwing role, uh-huh. and then they quickly needed somebody. They wanted a Robin really quick, and they didn't even give the writer. It was pretty much from when you hear about them talk about Batman. It was pretty much from up high editorial that they needed to put a Robin in real quick, and they didn't get a chance to really develop the character, and then. After Crisis was over, and they, you know, they got a chance to kind of do something different with them, they kind of went the other way with the character, and and both times you didn't get to see, um, get you didn't get to see him develop into anything. Like you got to see, there were so many stories of Dick Grayson. There's so many, and then when they did Tim, they really slowly developed Tim into a character that you like. But with Jason, he was pretty much thrown in the book, and then. You know, and he looked, he was so much like Dick Grayson. And then when they changed him after Crisis, he was pretty much just changed into a kind of a punk kid. You know, yeah. even with the origin, this is the guy that he stole the, the wheels off of the Batmobile. I mean, right. even from that, you know, that's his, his first dealings with Batman. Already, he's a punk. And then from there, they just kept going on. With that, 100%. I mean, with. Dick, you you have someone who's been in like I got been nineteen forty, and you went on to all the different stories that he was in Detective and Batman, and then he even starred in his own stories in Star Spangled Comics for a good number of years, and then he had his own solo stories in the Batman family. I, I think they were in the seventies, and then he evolved into the Teen Titans. And with Tim is sort of sort of similar in that. He had a couple of solo miniseries, you know, to develop as a character. And Jason was just kind of, you know, kind of thrown to the lions almost. It was just like, you know, we need a Robin. Here you go. Uh, After post-crisis, we need to change him up. Here you go. And I I don't think people really took to the character because he was so thrown in there and thrown, you know, 
quick fix as opposed to the other characters who I think had a more time to develop into characters that you could relate to and like. I recently went back and read my issues of when Jason first appeared, which had been years since I even looked at that, because I've read Death in the Family quite a bit, but to go back and actually read some of Jason's appearances earlier on, especially pre-crisis, when he was, like you said, more of a traditional Dick Grayson type Robin, I think one of the things I remember feeling during that time was, and I almost wish they'd introduced him as a different character post-crisis, because they took this character who was clearly defined as having the same story as Dick Grayson, who was he was a Dick Grayson clone, bright, likable, you know, it was like you had Dick Grayson back in the comic, which is a problem in and of itself, but you kind of started to identify him that way, then they turned him down a really different path. They dramatically changes his his character at the core, and I almost wish they had done that with him as a different person. Not call him Jason Todd, call him something else, because they really were at that point developing a whole brand new character. And I think once you've put that name on there, I think I think part of the problem I had was he lost an identity to me, if that makes any sense. Like, I didn't know who this character was anymore. And, I know, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I, I found that I didn't... I, I found that it was somebody who I was liking because of his similarities to Dick Grayson, and then I found that I wasn't liking him because they changed him so drastically from that. And it was like, whoa, <laughs> what, what have we done here? I wonder if I would have felt that way, though, if he'd been introduced as some other kid. You know, a, given a totally brand new name, a totally brand new start. If if I didn't connect him to that kid that was there pre-crisis or not. I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, it's something that I wonder. And it's something I really can't answer without them actually doing it. But it was it's an interesting character to talk about because of his his strange history. Because he has a very strange history. Yeah. Well, I think the problem was post-crisis, I think a couple of characters had gotten tweaked to a point where they were almost like new characters. I mean, like, if you look at Hawk from Hawk and Dove, he they kind of changed him around too. And I was, well, I've always wondered if it was just more of that you know, mid to late 80s dark turn that a lot of the characters seem to take. Like a lot of people say, oh, the 90s were the, you know, the the grim and gritty. But I think that really started more in like the mid to late 80s when you had like uh, V for Vendetta and Watchmen. You saw more character, DC characters kind of take that darker turn. And I wonder if that was part of what they were going for. They wanted like a darker, more punkish Robin to kind of fit that. And that's why they went that direction. And Dark Knight Returns and stuff like that all came out in the late 80s, too. I think it kicked off all of that. And I I think the reason why the 90s gets hit with it, I think that um, that was the start of it all. Mm -hmm. And then it carried over into the 90s. But you're right. You really have to look at the late 80s to see that that's... And and there was a lot of good that came out of that. I think the problem was it went too far. Too many characters were touched by it that didn't need to be. I find the balance far more interesting. Characters who are a little brighter interacting with these characters who have this darker edge. I think it it tells us something new about these brighter characters, whereas, mm-hmm. um, and then you learn more about that darker character. I think that's why we've got, like, Damien, just going back to that character, I think that's why we've learned so much more about Damien now, is you see him with, like, an Alfred. You see him with, you know, and, and you see him with the possibility that, like, okay, now that Bruce is going to be coming back, am I going to be replaced? And you see a vulnerable side to this kid that I, you wouldn't see if there wasn't a little bit more brightness in his world. So it's it's an interesting twist. Let's let's jump in and start talking about the film. And a lot of these discussions that we've already started, I think, are just going to continue thematically throughout it. The art style of the opening sequence of this, when we see the Palace of Ra's al Ghul, one of the things I'm liking so much right now is the sheer amount of Batman that I've been getting. We get like the Brave and the Bold Batman, which is you know definitely more of a, a family friendly Batman. But there's there's something iconic and accessible about that. But then we are getting, you know, like these dark... We get the film version of the Batman live action. We're getting then these direct-to-DVD release versions of Batman. And and it's they're all slight little tweaks and variations on this character while staying at the core to who he is. But there is a James Bond villain-like romantic majesty to Ra's al Ghul. I do love the sense of something proper from him. It's very different from the Riddler, Joker, or the Penguin. He feels very old... Do you guys have a favorite 
Batman villain. I'll go to you, Daryl, and we can kind of go around on this one. Do you have a favorite Batman villain, or do you just like the whole concept of like the Rogues Gallery? What what is it for you that attracts you? I I think I, I think it's just more of the Rogues Gallery. Like I like I like Man Bat. You know, with Neil Adams, I liked. Um, they had all of them had like good stories, like uh, Ra's al Ghul's. You know, the Demon Head. Um, that was a good story. Like they all had something different. Like even the KG Beast that he fought, that was a, a, a pretty good story when I read that. So I think it comes into the situations. I like you know any any villain that when they write Batman, he's in a really life changing situation. That's when I like the villain that he has to deal with. Jamie, it's interesting. I, I mean, Batman is one of those characters that I go back to reading when I was like you know five and looking back at more of an adult aspect I, i've always liked a lot of his different villains because you take each if you could look at each one of his villains there's an aspect there's like there's, a, there's like a cracked aspect of that villain that is part of batman's you know you know way of doing things the riddler with his his intellect and you know with the whole crimes thing uh two-face with his duality and I've always liked Two Face. Uh, Two Face, for for me, I think has always been a very interesting character because he he has these tragic beginnings, and he's a character that could have been he, he could have been a hero. I mean, he could have taken that tragedy and turned it into something positive, like Batman, and instead he went the opposite way. And I've always liked the duality of, of Two Face's stories. Um, I've also liked Ray Charles Gould because I he, he does remind me of sort of like a Bond villain in that sense that he he sees what he's doing and he feels he he ultimately feels that what he's doing is for is in the best interest of the world. And no one's gonna stop him. So but I've always liked Two Face. Two Face for me has been a, always been a very intriguing character. Jim? See, it's a tough one. You know, because you think about it, for me, I i don't think I've ever read a Joker story that I didn't enjoy. Mm-hmm. You know, just for, because of the pure, psychotic, evil, chaotic nature that the Joker is. You know, he is just so out there against Batman. But for some reason, I'm, I keep thinking Hush is just because Hush and Bane, actually, because... You know, when no matter how cool the Joker was, I, I always figured Batman could beat him. But with Hush and with Bane, both of them seem to me like they could actually take Batman. They could actually take Bruce down and they could finish him off. You know, Bane broke his back. Hush, he's opened up a pretty good can of whoop-ass on Bruce. So, you know, it's those two villains, I think, right now, I, you know, for some reason, I keep leaning towards those as some of my favorite uh, of his rogues. But the Joker is still there as just that that you get great Joker stories. And especially when you get the writers who aren't afraid to really make him nasty and really just make him psychotic, you know, evil killer kind of deal going on. But not to lose the fact that he isn't just this mad guy running around giggling. You know, there is a psychotic method to his madness. I think my answer is going to probably echo a lot of what all of you are saying, you know, in various pieces. My exposure to Batman, obviously, was the 60s show as a kid. That was my first exposure to him. That led to comics. One of the things I liked during the 60s show was these colorful rogues gallery. I loved all the characters, you know, the Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler, all those characters that on the Catwoman. They were just wonderful, and each one had their own unique gimmick their own unique thing that separated them from the others, so there was nothing cookie-cutter about any of them, which I really liked. When I started reading the comics, the one that stood out for me was Ra's al Ghul, because, kind of like what Daryl was saying, when I read the Ra's al Ghul story, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a character who is a mental and physical match for Batman, yet he has his own philosophy, very similar to what Batman does. I mean, not, they're, not, they're completely different philosophies, but his beliefs in them are so strong that he's the antithesis, almost, of, of what Batman is in some ways. Yet they're so much alike. I loved seeing a foe like that that helped me. And then with Talia being brought in and that whole sequence, we got to see a new side of Batman. We got to see that, uh, like, a, a romance with an adversary that really could hold his own with Batman and, and you could believe could beat him. As 
you know, my journey continued on. Bane very much had that same feel. Deacon Blackfire very much had that same feel. Where these were characters who could stand against Batman, but whenever when Batman encountered them, especially in their initial ones, like Bane, that whole Nightfall sequence where Bane was taking him apart psychologically, as well as physically, uh, I learned something about Bruce Wayne during that whole sequence of events and and what he went through with his back broken and all that that storyline took me on a journey i remember when when asriel was batman i was so much more interested in the little side stories with bruce wayne in a wheelchair where i would get to learn something more about him as a character and his strength and how he dealt with that and how he would be able to move on and there was something about that that i really enjoyed following uh, Deacon Blackfire was the same thing, another psychological breakdown where this guy really mentally broke Batman. And I loved following that story for those reasons. Hush, you get into that um, same reason, that storyline. It wasn't just Hush that I enjoyed in that, but it was Bruce giving into a relationship with Catwoman. And I could go on and on, but I mean, those are the types of characters that I'm really drawn to as far as villains, is the ones that, and Killing Joke going back to Joker and what you were saying, Jim, Killing Joke stands out for me as a great joke because it had so much of a major effect on Batman. And Death in the Family, for the same reason, This is a, those are stories where the Joker showed us something new about Bruce by the way that he was going at him in that story. There was something we learned about Bruce's journey with the Joker. Bruce learned something about himself and his adversaries in those stories. So, I don't know, that's, that's kind of my, my take on it. And this Rachel Ghoul story just made me it really captured in the beauty and the majesty of just even showing the sequence of seeing his palace. Uh, it really showed that the art team that was drawing this captured the home of this character who, since the 70s, has meant so much to me. And to see him captured so well on the screen. I mean, in this story with Raish al Ghul, they brought in Raish, Talia, the Lazarus Pits, you know, just... Everything that works, and also the fact that this character, while he's proud, he has a humanity to him. He has a sense of honor, a sense of dignity. It's not necessarily the honor code that I would stand by. It's not the honor code that I ever think Batman should stand by. But there is something that, when you see this story, Judd Winnick understood Raish al Ghul and what makes his story cool. That goes all the way back to the 70s. Definitely. I would definitely think so. I think... With with Raish, uh, you know, you were saying how how much similar he is to Batman and ideals. Like with Raish, I I've, I see Raish to Batman like almost in the same way I see uh, my other favorite character, Green Lantern. I see Hal and Sinestro. Uh-huh. Like they're they're very similar except in their ideologies. And with Raish, he he has codes. He has a moralistic code. It may not be. The, the the rational moral code, but it's a code nonetheless, and you definitely see that, and I love the fact that you saw the Lazarus Pit, and you saw Talia, but the only thing I don't really think you saw was Ubu, and uh, you know, I could have been wrong that the, the commander could have been Ubu, but I, mean, I would love to have, Ubu would have been a great part to have in there, but one of the things that I love about Judd is, is he gets it. He gets the character's he gets it. I mean, because he's like, he's been admitted. He's a fan. He he was a fan of these books growing growing up. So writing these characters, he 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 understands them in a way that maybe some people don't. And so that beginning sequence was just it was brilliant. It actually, and you touched on something there was where I'm planning on going next. Is they did a nice job of choosing which elements to sacrifice. They were on a time limit. You know, you're you're looking for a film that's going to run about an hour and ten minutes. You know, with mm-hmm. credits and everything, roughly. It, it would have been cool to see Jason's search for his mom as a motivation for why he was there with the Joker, but you know how she turned out to be a bad seed, and how he died a hero in that way. But I think they developed that whole feeling of him being a hero in those moments, and without having to go that route. It was a sacrifice that, because to throw that in and rush that would have lost that tone anyway. There wasn't enough time to develop it. And when you were talking about Ubu, that's a great example of, you know, was the character there or not? Maybe he was there somewhere. We could, you know, like you said, you could place him in there. But whether or not he was there, it didn't take anything away from this film. Tim Drake is a sacrifice they obviously made because he was a part of all this in the comics. But to try and... And they actually mentioned it at one of the San Diego panels because it was brought up, why was Tim Drake not put in this film? And the, the answer was to try and develop why there was yet a third Robin 
in this film for people who aren't exposed to other uh, being another Robin other than Dick Grayson, it it would have taken away from what we were trying to tell in this story. And that makes perfect sense to me. I would have loved to have seen Tim Drake in this. I agreed with the person that was asking the question. But I get why they pulled that out, because you've got to take a look at how can we tell the story we want to tell with Jason Todd and Batman. And you needed to have Dick Grayson there. There was a whole point in having Dick there, and he really serves the role that if you would have had Tim Drake in there, Tim would have served as well. And you, at that point, you didn't really need that. So they made sacrifices and pared it down and, and s- simplified certain elements while not losing any of the core qualities that made this a cool story as it came out. And that's a tricky balance, but I thought that's something that they made the most of every minute of this film. Enough action, enough drama, giving us the whole complete story with the psychological elements that are going on throughout it because there are a lot of different psychological personalities going on here. Everything from the way Black Mask was developed to the way the Joker was brought into all this to Bruce to Jason and philosophy differences and even Dick Grayson and what he brings to the table and how close he is to his mentor, to his father figure in Bruce. You know, and, and the way that those relationships worked. I loved seeing the action sequences with Bruce and Dick and how well the two of them played off each other. Because then when we saw Jason and Bruce together later in the film, the match there was like, wow. You know, I, I see very much similarities to what I saw with Bruce and Dick to Jason and Bruce when they're together, which shows that you know they went through the same t- training sequences and things like that. So it was kind of cool to see those kind of parallels, and you needed a Dick Grayson in here for that. But I understand why they sacrificed Tim Drake. Do you guys have anything you would have liked to have seen in the film that wasn't here? Talia. More of Talia. Like, you, you only, she didn't get to speak what I would have preferred if you... If we could have seen that Talia was the one that really wanted to do this for for uh, for Bruce because she loved him so much. Yeah, I you know uh, I, I agree that you know it's interesting on the changes you were talking about because I mean I liked what they did with you know with the whole death in the family thing because there's too much of story to have to kind of put into that if you're going to do it the way they did it in the story, but. What they did there was great in a in a way to bring in Raish and and you know the part with the the, the Lazarus pit and um, I, I'm I thought it was that part was done very well and and you can still see Jason as that defiant kid you know in the beginning as you know he's smiling at the Joker and really a punk kid and I I, I liked that while you had. Dick Grayson in it. I mean, I've always, I the way that he was done in the in the movie, I kind of wanted more of him because I just thought uh, Neil Patrick Harris did a great job yes. with the character. And if you even look at that that segment, there's so much exposition in that one scene. What is an Amazo? Who is Dick Grayson? I mean, I remember people talking I, you know, online about you know how would the average Joe villain know that Nightwing used to be Robin? But you kind of had to put that in there because. You needed that exposition of who Dick Ray, who Nightwing is, who Dick Grayson is, and you know, sort of like even with the Amazo, like you know, what is an Amazo for people who maybe don't even read comics but they like Batman and they like that, they like the DC Comics um, movies. You kind of need that to put in there. So it's you have to figure out how much exposition to put in and how much not to add because you don't want to already confuse. You don't want to confuse people, you know, further. So I, I think they did a good job. I don't. I don't. I think they put in just enough and took out the unnecessary parts and made a nice, clean movie. I mean, I, I'm looking at the back and it, it's 75 minutes long, and and it, it doesn't even feel like 75 minutes. I mean, it feels like you know, quick, quick, quick. And um, yeah, I, I think it was really done well. And I think you know. If you, they they added the right stuff. They took out the the, the things that not, that weren't needed. I mean, even Commissioner Gordon doesn't have a big role in it. He only has like a, maybe one or two lines. So, I, I think they did a well enough job in figuring out what needed to be in there and what didn't need to be in there. And you're right that there comes a point where it's going to be for especially for fans like us. I never felt there was too much exposition at all anywhere. I thought like the little nods to 
Dick Grayson being the former Robin and things like that, they were done so quickly and in the midst of a huge action sequence that I never got taken out of the film and the action and the pacing of this whole thing. It kept moving and cooking. You're right, 75 minutes, it flew on by. And that's one of the things we have to remember as viewers of this is they've stuck to this like 75-minute time frame for these films, you know, right around that ballpark for all of them. That's pretty much so they're what they're allowed for these because of the production costs of these films. So they did a really good job of staying in there. One of the things that I really liked with the changes they had to make, they kept the general feel of it. You know, when Jason Todd is getting beaten to death by the Joker with a crowbar, Mm -hmm. that was, that still kept that same type of violence, that same type of tragedy, that same type of horror that was going on. And to be honest, for me, because we were hearing the sounds and they were using a lot of shadow play and they're showing his his feet twitching around when he's being hit, it added something to it that you know more than what I had when I read the comic. When I actually read his death in the comic, this actual death of this Robin was more of a whoa kind of moment for me. Just seeing him, you know, get beaten down and then the Joker doing his little corpse while he's hitting him. Which hit, which hurts more, this or this? You know, kind of deal and just you know just the torturous nature of the Joker and just everything that was playing out there. I thought that was just a wonderful way to transition this into the movie, show the non, you know, people who've, had, who've never read this stuff, how this guy died. What happened to his boots? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> like, you, like the Joker wanted to beat him up with a crowbar, but he took his, he jacked his boots along the way. I don't get it. <laughs> Here's my lot. Well, maybe he likes it. Maybe like screen, you know, maybe he, you know, he wanted to try him on before he started beating them. But, you know, what, what Jim was saying, I, I remember seeing a sneak peek of, of that beginning scene where he's leaving at where Joker's leaving. And he has that little, you know, see you later, kid, you know, and I was like, I, I couldn't believe they were going to, I mean, I, I think they wanted to go further, but what they had in there was just almost hard to watch the first time. I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe how far they went with that. And the, the whole, does it, what hurts more, A or B, forehand or backhand? And uh, it was just, that's the Joker you, at his worst and his most diabolical and, and you know, comic book booky goodness. And it was something I was hoping they would do in just right and I think they nailed it, you know, perfectly that beginning scene. Yeah, and especially that scene when after Joker left and you see Jason kind of fighting back and he, he does the flip through, gets his hands and he starts doing that hobble to the door. It just it really made me think, will he live or won't he live? You decide kind of stuff. And it was a nice just can tie into that we can't say cliffhanger because we knew how it was going to end but it was still just a nice play on dun 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 on can he make it he gets to the door oh it's locked and then he sees the bomb i thought that was just a great just you know retelling of what happened before and horrifying just, drama yeah, because oh. it when this was released in the comic form i i couldn't believe what they were doing because you didn't see a lot of it on camera you just saw the joker swinging that crowbar around But it was brutal. The one thing I did like about the way this film handled it was I got more of the sense that this kid would have had some training because with the Joker beating him like he was in the film, uh, he had to have been rolling or doing something to keep himself from, like, getting more broken bones because the fact that he was able to move, you know, which I think fit his training, I thought it was a little bit more interesting in this. Uh, and just as well, too. Yeah. Because I think yeah. that, that entry, like, even even in the comic, how, even though his mother betrayed him, basically, just gave him to the Joker, that beating, what he went through, he was able to pull himself up. And he, you know, tried to rescue his mother, even after what happened. And I think in the, even though they couldn't have the mother in the in the movie, but they did show that just his force of will to survive to fight like you know they they wanted to let us see that jason no matter what he could be misguided you know crazy you know all that but he is a fighter and and we got that like he fought to survive no matter and it and it was just tragic that he couldn't tragic that that's what happened to him yeah because even in the in death in the family there's a a moment, there's a scene where Batman finds the mother, and he's and she even says that Jason 
threw himself at the bomb to kind of protect her, even after all that. So you, you're, you're seeing the Batman training there. And here is sort of the same thing where he, he does the flip to get, you know, sort of, you know, his hands in, in forward and he's walking. He's willing himself to walk and crawl to the front door. And you can see as it's locked and he hears a ticking bomb, he has a face of resolution that this is what's going to happen. And everything I think you see in that beginning part has something to do with the training he received from Batman. I'm obsessed with the decision to remove his boots. (laughs) This time around when I was watching it, I was like, I have an answer. You do have an answer for that one? Because if I'm the Joker... I mean, the boots, while snazzy and all, they clearly weren't going to fit him. He's so much taller. So I would have taken the utility belt, because that's got all the toys. But go ahead. What's your answer? Keeps him from running away. You, know, you figure about it. It's going to slow him down. It's going to mm-hmm. slow down his escape by you know taking out the boots. They're in the middle of the Arctic in the winter. utility belt, though. Well, that's still a psychological thing that kidnappers do to kind of make them vulnerable, like to take the shoes off. You can't just run through a... It was the cold. If he had yeah. ran out in those it, with no shoes on, even the cold would kill him. Like eventually, because he would die of hypothermia with no shoes on. Because remember, they're in the in the in the snow. But Bruce gets them back later. So where did he put them? Because they were in the case at the know. end of the film. I, I think- was like, I was. This is how this is how many times I've seen this film. <laughs> because this is not something that I cared about in the initial viewings. It was this last time through it, I was doing notes on it. I'm like, sitting there looking, I'm like, his boots are gone. So then I was looking at the case, and they show the case multiple times where it's like the chest up. So I'm, I'm like, okay, maybe Bruce doesn't have the boots. But then at the end of the film, when they show the case again, they do the tall view, and Alfred's asking him, do you want to remove that now? And, and Bruce still wants it there. And I love Bruce's answer of still wanting it there as a reminder. The boots are back. Well, Sean, if you start uh, putting a sock over your head with ink splots and they keep talking to you and you turn into Rorschach yeah. and, and you don't do it, just don't <laughs> watch something else. Don't let don't let it get be like that. You know, also, you also got to think of it like I, I would imagine that these guys, you know, as superheroes, they probably have to, like, you know, replace a costume every now and then. They probably get, you know, like bomb stains on them and blood stains on them and they probably have spares and you know bruce is kind of you know loaded he probably could have bought another pair of boots to put in the costume i mean i don't think that costume in the in the in the thing was was the same costume that uh that jason was wearing because i mean it was kind of blown up a little bit i mean if you want to look at it that way i mean it didn't look like it all ripped and torn and bloody you know so it, it, just something to think about <laughs> yeah, because when you bury your soldier, because he thinks of them as this is a war. Oh, seriously, that, getting this, and I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're comic nerds. We go right into it. <laughs> hey, you opened you, that you started door. it. I know I did. You started it. No, no, no. Right I'm not in. saying. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's. It is. A, it, this is a very comic booky discussion in a good way. I actually, but I'm. I'm laughing because I'm like I was. I was kidding about the boots, which you guys know. I'm not even saying you don't. Right. But but it's really funny how far this is going because you guys are like sitting here going, well, and now you see Sean. It's like he probably has other. Kids. I'm like, I get that. I'm kidding. <laughs> I actually never thought of that the entire time I've ever read Death in the Family. I I've always assumed that was Jason's suit from the actual sequence of events. But you're 100 percent correct in the sense that Jason was blown up. The suit that's in the case is not in tatters. The cape isn't any of the things that we saw in that iconic iconic image because Jason in the comic was wearing the classic Robin outfit. He never had this new version outfit uh, during that time. Uh, And I liked it though because it it kind of showed him Mm -hmm. kind of evolved from what he was like when he was like the young Robin into a more teenage rebellious Robin, And, and it kind of brought. That that Tim Drake, you know, that Robin costume. It, it got, I got a, a vibe from it from like the animated series and what he wore just before he became Red Robin. So it was kind of a neat thing to bring in because you because you, it shows Jason evolve as a character from from young energetic Robin to this more teenage brooding Robin. Yeah, I love the vehicles of this. Mm. That cycle in particular, because it was in the opening sequence, we saw that. I love the fact that it seemed realistic. Like, you could actually see, think you would, like, I, I could see that somewhere. But yet, 
the cool thing about all Batman tech, it's rooted in reality to a certain extent, yet you know from looking at it that like Bruce has got the next version. It's something that none of us could get. It's the prototype. It's got a little edge to it. And that clearly so, that motorcycle so clearly looked like it was a prototype for some other super cycle or some next generation version that had a little more kick to it. Uh, it's going to be a little faster than everybody else's. You know, it's just going to give him that, normally would give him that little bit of an edge to make it there in time in a situation like this. And that was the art styling of this film. I so totally appreciate it all the way through for things like that, Batman tech, because it's got to look cool. Yes. I mean, well, also with the whole, the fact that, that he was riding this motorcycle in the snow and he was kicking up snow all over the place and, you know, he probably had tires that had the right traction. And this is something, you're right, Batman, Batman's tech is, is rooted in a reality, in just enough reality to, to make it look cool, yet there's something you know, high tech, super high tech to the point where, you know, you need a billion dollars just to, to make the prototype. And, and mm-hmm. that's what Batman's stuff is. And that's why he's got the coolest toys of anyone in comics. And the, the bat cycle was something like when you look at, so when you look at, you know, any sort of bat tech or bat, you know, cycle or bat wing, you're, you're immediately like, I want that. I want that. I, I, that that's just how that's how why he's so cool. Part of what makes him so cool is his toys. He's got the coolest toys. That plane was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that plane was awesome. That I was also the coolest plane. The Batwing I've loved since the '89 Batman film. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I loved they did with this, I, I'm a big fan of seeing the tech evolve over time, and I loved the sequence where he was chasing Jason in the car. And we saw him latch onto the roof, and the roof pops off. I like that bit when he went into the tunnel. And you figure Batman makes his technology for Gotham. That's really the main purpose of it. You would figure at some point in time in a mission or a case, he would have had reason to fly, not necessarily in that particular tunnel, but somewhere where he would need to shrink that plane down a little bit smaller without losing the fact that it's still a plane. Mm-hmm. And I, when the wings shot in like that, and I love that on the fly he was climbing up into the helicopter, these are things that you can do in animation that would be very hard to do on screen, especially that on the fly, jumping on the ladder and yeah. going up into it. That Those sequences, I was just like, whoa, that is something that... I loved seeing here because it set it apart from, I love Nolan's films and I love what he's been doing, so this is not a knock on that. You can't do that live action, not with that kind of fluidity, not that kind of speed. You no. can do it, but not like this. No. Uh, and, but, you know, what, it's what, going back to what you were saying about, you know, Bruce thinking ahead, it, he, it, it makes why he's like, you know, he's the ultimate chess player because he's thinking five steps ahead. I had a little bit of issue with the chasing because they did that. The exterior was done in like a computer animated way, and I I, I kind of liked the more the traditional animation they kind of did, you know, throughout. But this looked too Pixar ish almost. I'm not really sure. It just it didn't. It, I don't know the chase scene. I, I liked what they did. It just I didn't like the method they did it in. But the overall scene itself was still very cool. But you're right. I love how Bruce thinks ahead. You know, each step, like five steps forward, I might need a you know a plane that can compact itself to go through a tunnel or or whatever. And you know, I'm going to need an autopi- autopilot, you know, so I can jump through a building, and uh, the plane will still be there when I and I need it again. And with the animation, there are scenes that they could do that I just don't think would look very well in real life, like the the whole chase scene with. With uh, Red Hood, Batman, and Nightwing, I mean, I-, I can't see them doing that in the live action because it was so brilliant. It looked so beautiful, and just the camera angles and the action was it was it was gorgeous. Well, I think the way that they did it in the animation can set a kind of a guideline for them to do it in a movie because it was amazing how they did the like. I, I swear they had to have had people move their bodies in certain ways so that they could know how it looks when they when they set up this animation. The way that the part where um, Jason jumped and hit a scaffold, how he turned his body 
so that the brunt of the impact would be towards the back to break the scaffold and then land and and then bend your knees when you land. I mean, it is animation a lot of, you know, not every everybody takes the time to to put those little details into something that's a cartoon. You know, you think of it as a cartoon, it's fine, you know, it, but there're things like when you don't bend when you land from a jump, that's how you can break your legs if you don't, you know, from the shock. Like all those little things that they did, you know how uh Nightwing would flip he would flip off the the wall a certain way like at an angle you know things that you would see in a in a circus like i've seen that you know when i've been to, to the circus over, since i was growing up like all those little things the way that he tumbles like he would you know uh, doing some type of, of move or whatever it just that's the parts that really got me into how well they uh really did this animation which makes me think that every time they do it like you said earlier they learn from every movie that they do uh-huh. and well one of the things anytime i've ever seen a making of an animated uh, film especially one that have action sequences like this they'll usually say how the animated you know the animators actually went through the artist would go through physical you know combat and go through you know like karate training or hand to hand training just so they know how their body naturally moves now i don't think they're having animators jump off of buildings onto scaffoldings but they're doing probably jumping and they're probably jumping down jump from this table to here you know just to see how just to get a feel how their body you know reacts and stuff like that so it's something that i always love seeing on the make of anything because you see this level of thought that goes into it you know because they actually do take it one step beyond just what they did a couple years ago Mm -hmm. and you know Mm -hmm. comics are a lot like animation in the sense that i think of the old classic disney cartoons um i'm i'm a big fan of classic warner brothers classic disney animation um i love hand-drawn animation in general but one of the things when i watch a lot of the black and white real footage of behind the scenes of what they did in the Disney studios, like for films like Bambi and stuff like that, they would bring in deer. They would bring in, you know, animals like that for those purposes to get it just right. And that it, wouldn't, it wasn't just a matter of just looking at a, a deer standing there. They would also take a look at deers running through forests, take a look through deers running through... Pla- reference material in comics. All comic artists use some form of reference for what they do, and a variety of sources of it. It's And it, that's not cookie cutter. Every It's... I'm sure very personal to the comic artist. Talk to comic artists on here who have folders full of reference material on their computers. I'm sure some have binders with pictures they've taken. I'm sure some have film reels. And that's something that that's hand in hand with animation where you use reference material for those purposes. Whether it's you have people doing those things specifically for that feature or you pull from reference material that you've seen before in other opportunities, films, wherever, that you've seen those things to get it just right. Uh, reference material is something that I agree was clearly used in this at a variety of different levels. Uh, and I, I, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about this was how fluid everything felt. It felt natural in something that these guys shouldn't be able to do these things. But yet, I never felt during the time that there was anything. I'm like, well, that's just crazy. Nobody could ever do that. And that's the sense of disbelief. They're suspending my disbelief that the fact that these guys would be able to keep going with the physical turmoil they're putting themselves through during these foot race chase scenes, which I thought were absolutely brilliantly done and incredible. I think one of the things that I loved about it, too, is like, you know, that's what these, you know, that's what comic books and these type of movies, you know, are supposed to do, like, you're supposed to be sensed in reality, yet these guys, you know, Batman and Nightwing and all these other characters are are they train their bodies to such a degree that they can do these things that most you know, almost all of us can't do. And mm-hmm. you say about the Disney cartoons is I remember seeing back these behind the scene things where they would film deer and and that was one of the greatest things about the Disney movies is that they had such a fluidity of motion and there were realism to it. Yet, you know, they're they're talking deer. But with with the Batman with this with this particular movie, one of the things I loved about it was that everyone felt different in the way they moved. Nightwing was the light. You know, he's he's a he's a lightweight 
acrobat, very fluid in motion. You can see that with the flips that he did during the Amazo fight. I mean, he he moves more. He has a quicker step, and he's a, more agile than Batman. Where Batman has a nice power and agility agility to him, and and everything was was shown just right and seemed that it could could have been real. It could have been like live action, you know, characters if they had done it live action. Yet there was – it was fantastical enough in that it was – you know, they're jumping like 20 feet from one building to the next and something only like you see in the Matrix. It was neat to seeing uh, Bruce and Dick cross the same area, but each one did it a little bit differently. I thought yeah. that was just a, a – well, just well done with the animation, with writing and just everything that they were thinking about this. They were thinking – you know, and well, it's it's Judd Winnick. He is a comic book writer, so they were thinking, you know, the comic book crowd, but they didn't make it only for the comic book fans. You know, the thing I thought was awesome was how they had moments in it. Like when I'm reading a comic book, there are times when I put down the book and I go, "Yay!" You know, kind of had those little energized moments. This movie had those energized moments for me. It was like when we first see uh, Red Hood. You had all the thugs gathered around. Hey, who called this meeting? You did. No, you did. And then he just pops up with the AK, fires a couple rounds, and just just his presence there, and even like the dialogue back and forth, because you know the thugs are calling him out, like, "Well, you want to die? Because there's easier." ways to do it yeah like yelling at a guy holding an ak-47 just really classic jason todd red hood kind of moments that you know i was like yes this is what i wanted to see this is you know the character i wanted to come out and it's just this head this live action even though it wasn't live action it still had that same energy for me did you think when they opened up the bag that this missing boots might be in there not the heads no, because no. you never actually see the heads. I mean, like, like wait, wait, these aren't our lieutenants; they're boots. boots. He really is crazy. I'm giving him. <laughs> Sean has got to scary. go on his own personal mission to find these boots now. He's them on, like boots, boots. Yeah. I liked the feeling with the Gotham underworld you were just mentioning, Jim. When they introduced him there, before we even saw Red Hood, there was this feeling of this need for one-upmanship. Like, they're all yelling at each other, trying to figure out who had the nerve to call the meeting and that type of thing, and why are you calling this meeting? Yet, there was a sense of fear as well. There was a lot of emotion in their dialogue that showed a variety of different feelings, both internal and external, from these guys, because there would be no trust in this underworld. The alliances are always tentative. You never know which guy... Like, the guy sitting across the table from you might have been your worst enemy a year ago. You might have killed members of your own family. So I loved that sense that was developed in a very short period of time. And it's something besides the script. You have to, the script was great. I agree with you. Obviously, it was delivered well. But you've got to commend the producers and the directors and the animators and everybody who put this together for the fact that they delivered mood and emotion and the voice cast. I thought the voice cast in this was absolutely stellar. Uh, this is one of the, like, usually I go, I think of Kevin Conroy when I think of an animated Batman, and he's incredible. I've got to comment, Bruce Green, he was so good, and I never at one point in time was like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, Bruce Greenwood is not Batman, you know, I, I, throughout this entire film, he felt like Batman right from the beginning straight on through, I was never taken out of this going, oh, we got a different voice, which isn't always the case in animation. You know, sometimes it takes me a while to get used to a new Batman voice. I never felt that in this. The, in, the voice casting was very well done for this entire film. Everybody seemed to match. I don't know if you guys had the same experience I did with this. Yeah, well, where Bruce uh, Greenwood, the emotion, this, it was the scene where you had the, at the end, where it had Bruce, um, Jason, and, and the Joker. And he was talking to, to Jason, telling him that, you know, I tried to save you. That even though he was still in character as Batman, you uh-huh. still got the emotion of he desperately was trying. He's like he's trying to save, like he's trying to save a drug addict from themselves with Jason. Like he was, de- he's desperately trying to reach out to to Jason, but at the same time, he knows that he has to put him down and keep him from killing anybody else. And so you got that conflict within Batman and I think towards the end you got the resignation that he was like I did do the best that I could but I would not cross I'm not going to cross the line even though I care about you as much as I do I will not cross that line and you got that 
from Bruce and Jason, especially with uh, Jensen Ackles. Yeah. Just the voice when he was telling Bruce that I forgive you for, for not being able to save me. But when he when he said to him, why didn't you to take out the Joker? Because he took me away from you like that part. It emotionally just got me. Yeah, that broke my heart. I mean, yeah, you can hear the hurt and the pain and the mm-hmm. anguish in, in those lines at the end. I'm not asking you to kill Dent or uh, or other characters. I'm just saying him. And there was so much anguish in those in the lines that he said. And one of the things that DC just they get they get it is the voices. I mean, every single animated project just they bring in the top notch voices that that fit these characters for these particular projects. I mean, you know, I, I will say in a subsequent viewings, I kind of wondered what Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill would have because in a sense they are to me the standard Batman and Joker. And I think with this film it would have brought their game to a different level because they've done Batman, they've done Joker, but this movie would have been, you know, I think another level for them because it would it, it brought those characters to a different level than they've normally played them but i love in you know because you don't you, you've seen batman played by different characters in other movies like the that justice league the uh, crisis on two worlds and uh i believe uh the um the other justice league the new frontier were all done by different mm-hmm. characters who played yes. the voice so i i didn't have a problem with the different char- with, with different actors doing the voice i mean each project is a different animal unto itself. So I don't need to have Kevin Conroy doing every Batman every single time. I mean, as much as he loved probably the check, the paycheck and everything, I mean, he's doing Batman in the next Bat in the next film, and he's doing it for online. And it's like I want to see how someone else would do this voice. And I think Bruce Greenwood did an amazing job in bringing the pain and anguish. I love the the part where. He realizes that is Jason Todd, and he's like, "Stupid mistake, stupid mistake," and you know, I should have checked. And you can hear the the pain and anguish in his voice for not being um, emotional and checking the, the 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 body when he brought it back. And I love the guy who did John DiMaggio, who, who did the Joker. I never watched Futurama. Some people have said they they heard the character he did in Futurama. I've never. Heard I never watched that show, so I don't know what that's supposed to sound like. But he creeped me out as a Joker. I mean, oh, he yeah, was yeah. like the, the scene where where he's they, they just freed him and he uh, he's having a meeting with with Black Mask and he's chomping on the the chips and he kills the guys and he's like, I want to I want something to wear and a new uh, and, and, and a big bu- uh, a big truck and I need some men, but not these men because they're kind of dead. And the way he delivered the lines were very creepy and he, I liked that he had a, like a, just a, a deeper voice to it because it, it added to the creepiness and I thought Neil Patrick Harris I mean I, I don't know what to say about Neil Patrick Harris I mean he, he just does great voices and he's done The Flash he's done Spider-Man he's done you know he did uh, a, car- a voice in uh, Batman Brave and the Bold and him as Nightwing I, I as soon as I heard he was going to do that voice for Nightwing, I was like, perfect. They're, they're, I can't think of a better person to do that voice. And the way he did the lines, like when uh, Batman gets in the car and he's like, just for once, can you say, let's get in the car? Is that so hard? I mean, it, it, they're the lines that were just made, you know, they were perfect. And a lot of it had to do with the writing. And, and Judd Winnick, again, gets these characters. But the way these the cast brought these lines to life were just – it was. Just, part of what I love about this about this movie. Yeah, it was when you're talking about that Joker scene, it was funny cuz I heard like a little bit of Heath Ledger Joker in there as well. They had yeah. that kind of mm, that creepiness right. to it that you know exactly what you're saying just how and even just the way it was drawn he's just quietly sitting there eating his potato chips. He's like, "Can I have some water?" Bam bam bam, kills them all off and he's like, "I'm going to eat some guys. Not these guys." You know, it was just that great kind of, you know, 
Joker moment. And I got him. I'm going to throw myself under the bus here a little bit. I really got. I'll drive it. Okay. I really got <laughs> emotional, and I kind of got choked up with a couple scenes in this movie where while I didn't actually shed a tear, there was one building. And I had to tell myself a couple times, hey, this is just a comic movie. This isn't real. Calm down. And, you know, just the those ending sequences with... You know, with Bruce, you know, with the, um, oh, yeah. after Bruce, you know, I was like, no, leave it. You know, as a reminder for what his failure with Jason just, that, then they go into that happy sequence where Jason first puts on the costume. He's like, yeah, this is great. I'm the boy wonder. Oh, this rocks. And I'm just sitting there just watching this going, and I know what he becomes. And I'm just like, oh my God. And just had Bruce having that little smirk on his face, kind of, you know, he's, you know, you can tell Bruce was in a happy place and it just, everything that happened. And I was just like. Oh my gosh! You're and not then, alone. Oh, when I saw that oh, scene, oh I was like, I did get a little sad. Like I sat there <laughs> sad seeing that because that was basically, I was thinking of that's Bruce thinking this is the last time that me um, that was the closest me and Jason ever got, and that was the last. Uh, I think that was Jason. That was him knowing that Jason was pretty much saying goodbye to that positive part of himself that lived that light that he had that Batman saw in him, even though he saw the darkness that he, you know, when he talked to Alfred, he saw that in him, but he did see that light. And I think that it was sad that he had to say goodbye to that. With you with that one, because I, I I'll, and I'll, I'll be under that bus with you because when I saw that scene and this, how happy he was and he's fighting, this is the, this is the greatest day of my life. I, I mean, I wasn't shedding tears, but I mean, that was, I was just so heartbreaking because you see what happens Throughout the movie, and then you see this bright moment, and even the first bright moment you see with uh, Jason as Robin, you know, flying through the air, all making the, making with the jokes and, and everything like that. I mean, it, it's so heartbreaking because you know where it goes. It isn't. It isn't though, because if you take a look at the sequence, and I totally agree. First of all, I'm not negating anything you guys are saying because I had that same You're emotional heartless. reaction. No, <laughs> I'm not heartless. <laughs> no, I'm not heartless. I actually see the brighter side of the whole thing. This is this kid who ri- jacked his car tires, who Bruce was trying to save. Those happy moments that we saw, Jason would have never had, and this is something that Bruce has trouble seeing because of how dark his light's been. Jason would have never had those happy moments ever in his life if Bruce hadn't taken a chance on him. True. So yeah, I mean, it, true. It, it, it is. Yeah. I mean, I'm totally agreeing with everything you guys are saying. It's just you got to also look at that end of it. There's a positive to that story. There's this guy who said, you know, because you figure he's a kid who's off the on the streets. He's doing what basically makes him a vagrant, ripping off these car tires and things like that. And and Bruce is like, you know what? No, I see something else there. I see an opportunity. I see a chance because of what I've been given, the gifts I have, the fact that I money's not an object for me. I can take this kid and hopefully save somebody. Because that's his goal, his mission in Gotham, is to hopefully save his city so people don't have to go through what he went through. Mm-hmm. And, and that- you're right, because he, there is even, I think there's even a moment in the movie where he's talking about, you know, I saw this kid who was troubled, but I saw something beyond all of that, and... Mm-hmm. That's the reason why Bruce takes a chance on, on Jason, and you see that in those moments, especially the moments where he's wearing the traditional Robin costume, like the where he's fighting the Riddler, and he's making, you know, riddle me this, what's red and, you know, yellow and green, like, me, I'm, when I'm, when I'm on your story butt, and he makes these, he's the light Robin that, you know, almost is Dick Grayson-like. He said that to Alfred, remember when he said to Alfred, he said that if I didn't take him under my wing he more than likely he would have been a, a criminal right yeah remember he said he would have went full into being a criminal and he so he he said that they did touch that even that part conflict and uh, i gotta compliment andrea romano she did the voice casting for this film I, I, one of the keys there especially with bruce and jason every voice cast member had a role in this that was very important those two they needed to be actors who could bring out that conflict because you needed to see the rage that these two both exhibited but also that there was something else beside the rage and that there was definite distinctions between the amount that one would fight the rage and fight for understanding in that internal conflict because jason throughout this whole thing is angry but yet he's striving for something more and, and there are similarities between 
Bruce and Jason and their overall goals. Jason's reasoning, and I question the nobility of Jason's reasoning, he's trying to save Gotham, I, I think partially because it was something he did as Robin, but I think also partially to prove to Bruce that his ideas are better, he could do it better. It's his way of saying to Bruce, hey, you know what, it's, it's about controlling crime, not stopping crime. You never controlled crime, and look what happened to me because of it. And why didn't you, after what happened to me, why didn't you kill this guy? Why didn't what? you control the crime? And that's a huge huge distinction about this because the moral dilemma is it is something that the joker brings to the table more so than some of the like a racial ghoul people like that that you think you can reason with you're not going to reason with the joker that's never going to happen so i i totally am on bruce's side and i agree with bruce but i loved the sense of conflict where jason was putting something on the table that i think is a very legitimate concern for somebody to have i don't agree with him but I thought this was the conflict and the sense of it between these two characters was so well developed that you could see parallels between the two, and you can clearly see where they jump off on those. And that, well, that I think a, is brilliant. That was a big question in the comic after that had happened. Finally, when he killed Jason, that was a big question in comics. And then as the, you know, they started to have the internet and stuff, is why is the Joker still alive? Why doesn't Batman finally kill him? And end it. It even was a story in Birds of Prey uh, way back when with Chuck Dixon, where I think one of them asked, why don't we just kill this guy and get it over with? I think, yeah, you know, it's funny because you see a bunch of moments in the movie where you see a clear distinction like in Arkham that where Batman, you know, picks up the Joker and he's like, are you going to do this time? Or are you going to put me in another bo- you know, body cast for like six months? And you see different you know there are different aspects where you 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 see the difference between jason what jason wants you know batman mainly works on fear and but then jason says well what about the people that don't fear you what about people who aren't scared of the big batman you gotta take those guys out and you know it all goes back to something i remember i think going in the comics it was it was the batman and sun article uh storyline where I think Damien is about to take out some some crooks and Bruce stops him and he says something along the lines of – and this is why Batman is where he is compared to everyone else. He, he said something along the lines of anyone can kill but what we do takes talent or we, what we do takes skill. And that's what sets Batman apart from most other non-superpowered you know, f- uh, crime fighters is that – Batman has the ability to, you know, take down crime, but he still he's he's got a code, and he does it within the code. And I've always heard people say, "Well, why didn't he take out the Joker?" Because the Joker has done all these different things. But in the large sense, the Joker wants Batman to take him out. The Joker yeah. really sings because if Batman takes out the Joker. The Joker has won. There, there's no he'll, – he'll have won forever because there's no way to come back from that. I mean unless you know, you're in comics and down the line you can get brought back to life. But the, the idea that Batman has to – would kill the Joker would be the Joker's ultimate victory because he is breaking one of his own codes, his probably most biggest code not to kill. And that's how he has – and that's the only way to take him down. And, and yeah. I think – you even see that in the Killing Joke. You know, you, you see that Batman when he goes after the Joker in, in that in that part, he has murder. He has probably murder on his mind. But the Commissioner Gordon says you have to do it by the book. You have to show him that our way still works. And you see Batman showing, you know, telling that Gordon wasn't gone crazy. Maybe it's just you all the time, and that is what gets Joker even more incensed. It's the fact that Batman can do this without killing him. It's more than that, because it sets a dangerous precedent. If, like, Jason keeps saying, why not just the Joker? I'm not saying the Penguin. I'm not saying the real. Why isn't he saying the Penguin or the Riddler? And at what and is there going to be a point in time where you do say the Penguin and the Riddler? Once you cross that line and you set that precedent with the Joker, what happens when a situation arises where these other people start skirting those lines? Where do you stop? What makes it okay for you to do that? Like, Jason, when he's pulling out that crowbar... I think one of the key sequences of this is when Jason pulled out the crowbar and started beating the Joker with it and started doing what the Joker did. Well, why didn't he just kill him there? 
because you know there comes a point in time where you are crossing a line. You are becoming like that person. When you start taking the rules and throwing them out the window, you kill the Joker. Well, okay, then the conversation becomes a year from now. The penguin kills somebody, or the penguin does this thing. Well, now we kill the penguin. Now we kill this person. Now we kill that person. Where does it stop? Where does that line come back into play? And the, the truth of the matter is, it doesn't once that happens. And it's then it's then you're setting the precedent not just for yourselves, but also for everybody else. Well, also Bruce is so like Bruce has so much anger in him that he said like, and I love how they put it in there. When he said, if I cross that line, I'm not going, I'm not, I'll never be able to come out of that. Yes. Because there are parts, yeah, yeah, there are parts of him where it was in one of the comic stories where he thought in his head, he went through a thought of how many ways that I could kill the Joker. Like he sat, he was sitting at a, I think he was in a bad cave and that was during the time he was really going through an emotional journey with about Jason and he sat there going, I could, you know, what he could do, he could crack his neck, he could, all those different skills that J- that Bruce has learned, which he is a trained killer. And there's actually uh, one of my, my, one of my most favorite issues of Batman, you know, Nightfall uh, issue, where he finds a Joker, and he starts pounding him, yelling Jason's name, he's just mm-hmm. beating him, yelling, Jason, 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 and... You could, you know, when I first saw that, I'm like, oh my god, he's gonna do it. He's gonna, he's gonna beat him to death. And it, it's just one of those things where, like he says in the in the in the movie, if I went down this route, I would never come back. I mean, at what point does all the good outweigh maybe? Oh, well, I've done all this good. You know, I can take this guy out. No one's gonna care because you know he's done X, Y, and Z. I think once you start rationalizing that, you've gone down a dangerous path and and that's something Bruce I think fights to to not do and and that's what sets him apart from 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 Jason the key to that nightfall issue was to the Joker was one of the later villains that he had found mm-hmm, right nightfall. and Bane had released all of the villains from Arkham as a way to slowly break down Batman Bruce had been without sleep uh, he'd gone through so many other villains and that sleep deprivation gotten, and not only just sleep deprivation, the amount of physical exertion of going after all of his major rogues. And Bane was playing puppet master and setting up those situations in such a way to slowly break this man down. By the time he hit Joker, there were other factors working in all that. And you were, I'm not taking anything away from what you just said. Amen, I 100% agree with you. It's more so for people who haven't read Nightfall. Right. The, the mm-hmm. build to the to everything you just said was so perfectly laid out, and yet he still stopped himself. Um, exactly. Which even adds more to the reasons why you need to do this. It's funny. There's there's been a couple articles recently, and and I I just glanced over them, so I've got to admit I haven't read them completely. But I'm I'm going to actually read them about how um, our superheroes good role models and things like that. Like any fiction, I, I think you need to read it as fiction understand that it's fiction and yet take messages from it i do think one of the cool messages about this batman story and the conflict between these two characters and how you can connect it with any person forgetting the killing part of the whole thing we all have lines that we need to keep in our lives in order to be balanced individuals those lines can be financial those lines can be work related those lines can be hobby related they can be related to anything you have to have lines that if if you cross them, if you go too far with them and head down a path where you get into excess with that or make a mistake in that direction, you could do serious harm to your life, to your philosophy, to, you know, your, it, could be, it could be something that could affect your career, your family, something, depending on how it hits. And that mm-hmm. is something about this story. When you connect with it on that level, it's very deep. And there is something, there's messages that are in comics that uh, are metaphorical. And you can connect with them in different ways. If you're not, sometimes it's not about being literal. You know, sometimes it's about, you know, taking a look at the metaphors there and saying, okay, you know, what can I get out of this and how can this connect with me? And maybe it's, maybe the big issue here isn't that there's killing and gunplay and stuff like that. It's the deeper psychological elements of this story. And this is a deeply psychological story. When you look at the Joker, why does the Joker want Batman to kill? Because to him, the ultimate joke would be to ruin Batman. He would be willing to die 
to ruin Batman and what he stands for. The fact that this man's a symbol. You know, it's one of the things that we've, we're seeing in the current Bat books with Dick Grayson being Batman is that there needs to be that symbol in Gotham. Look what happened during Battle for the Cowl before that, where what was Gotham like when people thought Batman was dead? Symbol of fear and hope, and when you had Bat, when you, have, when you, when you take that away, you get lawlessness and you get jokers, you get chaos. And so having Dick Grayson in the current Batman has brought that back. And you're right. I mean, Joker, Joker is the, he's the agent of chaos. That's what, you know, that's what you saw greatly done in, in the Heath Ledger role. And he, everything to him is a joke. Everything is, I'll do this to make you do that. And I think having Batman kill him would be the ultimate joke for him because he would make Batman, who has these kind of codes, break all of them by, by doing that. And that would, uh, this was, you know, this is something that I think on a lot of levels you see that in this, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a lot of times you, you kind of go up by that, you know, are you going to kill him? Are you going to cross that line? But there's also a lot about the relationships between, you know, you see the relationship between Bruce and Jason. You see the relationship between Bruce and Dick. You just allow that relationship. You see, you know, during the Amazo fight on how well they work together and, when uh, Dick gets injured and Bruce tells him, I want you to be safe. You did everything you could, and I thank you for that. And you see that relationship as well. And even Dick's a little put back. He goes, he said, thank you? That's weird. And, you know, it's all those sorts of things. You know, the relationships between these characters, you know, past, present, and how much they, Bruce loved Jason. Even, even, even now, he probably still loved him even though he's done these things. Well, it was the thing with um, with Bruce, when he first started fighting Red Hood, when he first started chasing Red Hood, you could see it in his eyes, you know, that he was thinking, is this J- he, whether I don't know if he was consciously thinking, is this Jason, mm-hmm. but he could tell. There was something about him, because they kept saying, no, he's clues. trained. He's like, he's trained, yeah, he's well trained. And you could almost hear him say, it's like I trained him kind of deal. And that's why I, when that scene with him and Dick Grayson, when he thanks Dick Grayson, he's thinking of Jason. He's thinking of the failure to, one, save Jason physically, but also save the person that was Jason. And I think that was kind of like his displacement. He was saying thank you to Dick Grayson, but really he wanted to say thank you to Dick, to Jason Todd for all he did. And mm-hmm. it was like, that's how I kind of saw those sequencing where even before he was able to hear the voice, you know, when he did that cool thing with, you know, editing out the train sound to hear him say Bruce. He had the idea. He had the notion subconsciously in the back of his head. What and was he? What was he? Um, there was one thing that threw me off there. Hmm. I'm totally agreeing with everything you're saying, except when you said that he, when he said thank you to Dick, yeah. that he was saying thank you to Jason Todd. Yeah. See, I took that totally as him saying thank you to Dick for being there during this emotional time, because I think at that point you're right. He started to see little clues, and subconsciously, because I think he was still very much in denial at that point that it was Jason. Yeah. yeah. But I think he started to see little clues, like when the line was cut with the knife, there was little tiny clues that were coming in there. Because that, that knife cut thing was something that stood out for him big. What was he thanking Jason for? It's kind of like the... The, the thank you, he ne- the thank you, he never got to say to Jason because you saw at the end there, the end of you know Bruce and Jason's was a little bit more. They were more butting heads than the way they had that positive beginning when he was a little kid. As he grew older, because you saw how rough Jason took down that drug dealing scum, and he's like, he was scum. He deserved it. It's like we needed him. Al- we needed him awake. You put him into shock. See, we I, needed I him. Got, thank I, you. I, I kind of get well, those I, two are butting. I got heads. sorry. Bruce yeah, wanted to say, I'm I, sorry for not saving you. And I don't think it was just not saving... I don't think he's sorry for not saving him from the Joker. Uh, I think that's part of it. But I think it's also not saving him the way that he originally intended. I never got Bruce having this amazing need to say thank you. And if not, you're remember- yeah, and that's the thing I got out of that, too. Because when I hear him say thank you to Dick, I think he, I think it was just to Dick. It's... That's why I don't think you needed Tim Drake. I think with with the Dick, with having Dick Grayson in there, and you see them fighting together, you know, fighting the Mazo, and how in sync they were. I mean, they were completely in sync with each other. Right. And when you when he's saying thank you to Dick, 
at the end because that, that, that's that's basically Dick's um, that's Dick Grayson's you know exit scene until like you see that little montage at the end. He's thanking Dick Grayson for being who he was from the very first time they met to mm-hmm. now. Because because Dick Grayson, while while Jason Todd is probably Bruce Wayne's greatest failure. Dick Grayson is probably one of his big, biggest successes. I mean, he he went from Boy Wonder to Nightwing and this great person and crime fighter. And that has almost everything to do with Bruce Wayne getting him to where he was. So when he says thank you to Dick Grayson, I, I, I think he's saying thank you for being who you are. When I'm saying he say, he wants to say thank you to Jason, it's not actually him saying thank you. It's the emotional release that po- that moment that he never got to have with uh, Jason. That you know, because I I saw the end of Bruce and Jason's team up to being very a negative kind of butting heads. They lost the positive fun. Yeah, this is great. I'm the boy wonder kind of moments towards Jason kind of going a little bit Except darker. They didn't really it. have those moments. I think. Okay, I'm the, seeing this off no, screen in my head. Really, I think what the film was trying to show at the end is that they had that very small moment where it looked bright and it looked happy and it looks like there's a chance for that. But if you remember back in the middle of the film when they were doing that whole montage, that was Jason Todd. The big right. problem with Jason as Robin post-crisis was he went a little too far. He was a little too violent. He was and disrespectful to Bruce. I There was a number of times reading Batman during that time, I wanted to reach into my comic and smack Jason Todd and tell him, listen to Batman. So and I remember mean, at the end he said to Jason, he said, there was something that I you never understood. Is mm-hmm. why I do what yeah. I do. You never understood that, even though he cares about Jason. But he he said that, and even in the movie, they show you a scene. They make sure that they show you him fighting with Dick Grayson, as opposed to how he fought with Jason in the middle. Like with Dick Grayson, they trusted each other. When they were fighting Amazo, they trusted each other. When the line broke, all of that hit um, Dick Grayson falling, knowing he knew that Bruce would be there for him to grab onto at the at the end when the, when the bomb exploded. He when when um, Batman told him to um, Dick to do something, he would do it because he trusted Bruce without question. Jason, on the other hand, when they fought those um, cyborg uh, with those guys that were armored up. They separated. They didn't fight together. And when, even when he said, you know, fight, they kind of separated from each other and fought. And they, and they didn't even do that well when they did that. They weren't fighting as a cohesive unit like, right. they, like Dick and, and, and Bruce was. Like even when Bruce got, stopped the helicopter from dropping, there's a point where he's riding down the rope where he, in his hands you can see the, the spark coming out of his hand. But there's Dick Grayson coming down and scooping him up. To get mm-hmm. you know to, to do the save, and you saw a more cohesive unit, you know, than when you were saying like where they were fighting the the robotic cyborg type guys. They weren't really fighting together. They weren't they weren't doing like these well, com, you know like com, cool combo moves and together. There was more of a separation as opposed to when Dick and, and Bruce would fight together. Right. But I did see one of the things I liked, and I agree with you. But one of the things I did like about that sequence is there was a familiarity between the two that worked in that sequence. So I, I don't think they were totally divorced. Oh, that's um, true. Yeah, that's true. No, no. They, you, you saw them fighting just in, together enough where there was a familiarity, where there was a past, but it wasn't as cohesive as it was with the Amazo fight. And then the history that Bruce and Dick would have together. One right. of the things that... I, going back to what Jim said, and one of the areas where maybe you could connect this, I, I felt a lot of this, Bruce was feeling regret. And I think where the thank you comes in, it wasn't regretting saying thank you to Jason, though, and this is where, we're gonna, this is where we disagree. It, I think because he regretted saying, I'm sorry for not saving you to Jason, or you know, not, he regrets not saving him, he was saying thank you to Dick Grayson out of regret for because one of the, my favorite moments at the end of the series night's end at the end of nightfall and all that the, the whole thing was done the whole Azrael resolution resolved but they had this great issue where bruce and dick finally meet face to face and the two of them talk about things that are unsaid between fathers and sons and it was one of the great moments where it was is Bruce has a lot of trouble admitting his own emotional flaws and his own emotional 
inability to complete the thoughts and say the things that he really would want to say to Dick Grayson, for example. And that thank you moment, that thank you moment so totally fit that end of night fall, that night's end for me. Because when you were looking at that moment, he was saying thank you to Dick. And Dick reacting and saying, you never say that, you know, that's something he never says, and that little shock was, I think he was so totally saying that to Dick Grayson. There is a connection to this whole sequence of events because of regret. And I do think by the time when Dick Grayson left, I think Bruce did subconsciously know what the that there was going to be somebody saying Bruce there. I think he heard it. I think he was in denial mm-hmm. to a certain extent, the same way that he never looked into the coffin. I think grief and certain feelings, Bruce was seeing something that he's not comfortable with, his humanity, that there is a flaw somewhere emotionally that he can have, that any normal human would have. But Bruce wants to hone himself as this perfect soldier. He even refers to Jason as his soldier at one point, you know, that he was a good, my soldier fell in battle and that type of thing. Bruce sees himself at times in that light and wants to hone himself so perfectly. It's one of the things that, so, I mean, there is a connection to what you're saying, Jim. I just didn't see him saying thank you to Jason. That was the part when you were saying it that was confusing me. Because I, I totally felt that that was completely to Dick Grayson, but I think I'm getting a little more of the idea of how you're connecting it, it a bit to Jason. It's the regret of his inactions with Jason, his regret of his emotional responses. It was kind of one of those things. It's the the subconscious regret that he had, thinking, okay, this is Jason come back. These are the things I made the mistakes on Jason. I'm not going to make that mistake with Dick Grayson. i got to make sure I tell him thank you. It's kind of that, you know, when you... Do you mean saying someone, things that are unsaid? Yeah, see, he, Bruce in his mind is okay. looking uh, over the stuff. Oh, that yeah, Bruce, I, 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 I see what he's saying now, and it, it makes more sense when you put it in that aspect, because yeah, Bruce doesn't... he. He, I don't think he's learned how to open up since his parents died. And there's a lot of things that he does not... One of the things that Bruce is not really good at is dealing with other people in an emotional context. And so I, I see what Jim's saying a bit more now in, when he says thank you. He's saying, you know, not just thank you to Dick, but he's saying, I wish I had said that more to Jason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's that kind of deal. Because especially when, you know, think about like when someone has goes through mourning and you're going through a process, you, you lose someone close to you. Those that are still around you, you take that moment to say, hey, I, I never told you what I think. I never told you how important you are to me. I don't want to make that same mistake with you. And that's why even it threw off But he Dick will Grayson. continually. That's the, one of the things that I love about Bruce. And I'm not, I'm not disputing anything you're saying there. You're 100% correct. But one of the one of the hard parts about Bruce is he says those things so rarely because he slips back into the Batman mode, and he shuts those things off and pushes them away. But it's one of the reasons why we as fans, you talked about, you guys all talked about it. I totally agree with you. You get those tearjerker moments at the end when you see that moment. That issue of Night's End, why does that stand out for me after all these years? Because that was a tearjerker moment for me when he had that moment with Dick Grayson. Because we see them so rarely. And I wouldn't want Bruce to be all huggy and lovey all the time. Because if he was, we would lose that. Uh, right. it's, a, it's a quality that I love when he has those moments and we see growth. I think we've seen growth with this character since one year later, for example. You know, where he's gradually grown and he's become a little bit more accessible. And yet, it wasn't this drastic jump where we lost that other side to him as well. But these moments are, are things that are important when you see them with Bruce. Because they're genuine, they're heartfelt. We all believed those moments when they happened in this film. Uh, because we know that that really is what Bruce feels. And when he, why was he so obsessed with finding out the identity? Why did he you know, make sure that DNA was brought back? He had to know for sure. He, he needed to be 100% positive. I mean, it wasn't enough just to see the DNA. He had to then take the Batwing and fly to Ray Shaw Cool to yeah. get for, What did you do? But even before that, he, mm-hmm. he, he, had, he had to go further and he, he dug the grave and saw that it wasn't mm-hmm. a real body in there. And then he went to, to Ray Shaw Cool. And, and that was, those were moments where I was like, it shows how far this man needs to go in those situations and and the issues that he has you know bruce has issues and it's one of those things like why why is robin you know like dick grayson and tim drake more of our avenue into batman's world because they're a little bit more mentally balanced (laughs) it's true it's really true 
You, but, you think but, about it. This is a guy who made a pledge when he was a grieving, what, eight-year-old? Yes. And he's, eight-year-old, yeah. He's dedicated to his life to this pledge he made as this child. Which nobody can really do. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that's impressive about Batman. He's honed himself in this way that nobody really can, and that's why we all love him. But yet, in order to be that driven, in order to really give that much of yourself, there has to be issues there underlying that. And I, I, it's one of the things I think where comics have been really smart with this character and continue to explore the depths that that goes with him. And given him, I think, I think this character is only, why does he last it so long? Because there's always more layers to explore with this guy. There's more places to take him. Uh, like when he comes back in the current storyline, like, I'm ex- so excited for that month where some of the books aren't going to be published and it's going to be all the return. Because we're going to see interactions with him and the various people in this changed world. Because the world has changed. It's not going to go back to the way it was before what happened to Bruce in R.I.P. and Final Crisis. It has been drastically changed in his absence. He is going to be back in it, but we are, I mean, clearly, you know, from some of the announcements, we're going to see drastic changes. But it's more fun for us to see these moments like we just saw on screen. We're going to get some of these moments where Bruce is going to say and do things that we all have wanted him to see for ages, do, yeah. and, and we know that they're going to be rarities. There's going to be some progression with him. We're going to see something new from him out of it. But yet, we're not, it's going to still be little tiny changes. Him and Catwoman, I want to see that meet up. I know that's going to be coming in an issue. Same with Barbara Gordon. I want to see him with, obviously, the, the number one top, even more than Damien, for me, is him with Dick Grayson. I want to Hello? see what that conversation is going to be like, because he told Dick Grayson not to do this. Yeah. Dick Grayson did it. And you know what? I, I've got to imagine Bruce is going to realize that he was, that Dick, that he was wrong. That Dick Grayson did the right thing. I don't think. I think Bruce told Dick not to become Batman, figuring that's a good way to get Dick to do it. I disagree with it's you. It's not a reverse psychology thing. Okay. But what it is, it's it's kind of like the whole Matrix and Neo thing, where you tell them what they need to know to pursue the path. By telling Neo he's not the one, it let Neo embrace the path let neo become the chosen one by telling dick grayson don't become you know batman he's not putting that pressure onto dick to you know you must wear the mantle your gotham must have a batman bruce is going to know gotham needs a batman and bruce will probably have wanted dick to pick up the mantle no. but he had to tell dick no don't do this so you know dick is actually chooses to be batman so you know dick chooses to put on the mantle i'm gonna 100 percent disagree with you there i i agree with you in the sense with what you're saying that he said that to allow i think at this point and when and it's one of the poignant things about it i would agree with you in a different way if it was maybe to tim drake where he hasn't developed yet i think bruce has such a high respect for dick grayson and how far he's gone that was his way of saying you have made your own life I don't think Bruce foresaw that Dick Grayson would take over Batman and make it his own. And I think this is going to have a profound effect on Bruce when he comes back, where he's going to say, wait a minute, I need to rethink this whole thing. Look at what Dick was able to do. Look what he did that I didn't expect. Uh, He expected him to carry on his Nightwing because he developed his own life. Not that he would, in his own way, embrace... He didn't take over Bruce's mantle. He made the mantle his own. There's a huge difference there. He hated being Batman. Right. If you look at Prodigal, if you look at Prodigal, that was was Dick Grayson trying to be Bruce Wayne. And that was why... Even they even make a mention about why Bruce Wayne didn't pick... Dick Grayson, or he picked John Paul Vallali over Dick Grayson because he had seen Dick Grayson evolve into his own per- being, his own person. And so, when you see, uh, if you ever read Prodigal, Prodigal is, is you know the son sort of taking over for the father and not fitting, being a little fidgety and uncomfortable and not really fitting well. Whereas, but also knowing it was finite. Because he right. knew Bruce was eventually going to come back. He just didn't know when. It wasn't Bruce's death. Bruce had already come back and taken over from Gene Paul, and then he left again. <laughs> right. but, with, but, with, but with this, you see, you see the Grayson taking 
what was, you know, his, you know, Bruce's and making it his own, making yeah. Batman something different. And, you know, I, I, I go back to, I think it was Batman and Robin number 12, where he's having that conversation with Jim Gordon. And he even, there is even a mention that the, the, the cops prefer him to the other bad guy. And it's just like these little things that you can see that Dick made this. You know, he's not—he's not being Bruce. He's being Dick Grayson, but Dick Grayson as Batman, and not Bruce Wayne as Batman. And that's, I think, the difference in now, how when Bruce comes back and he sees that Dick has made this role his own, he's going to be like, hmm, you know, because you know, I think one of the things that most sons wonders does my father want me to follow in his footsteps and most fathers like you don't have to be me you have to be you and that's what bruce has always wanted for dick grayson yes and no because they had arguments during their time with batman and robin they, they had years where the two of them argued oh, before absolutely. he became nightwing i absolutely. i don't think for bruce this was an easy journey at all it's one of the great things about continuity is you know all that stuff from the past happened and led to the points where he's at now. I do agree with you, Jim, on, on thematically on one thing you were saying in the sense that I do think Bruce was trying to empower him, which was thematically where you were going with that. So I don't want to I don't want to make it seem like I'm totally saying Jim, you're totally wrong and all that. I thematically what you were saying, you and I are completely in sync on. I think he was trying to empower his eldest son and Dick Grayson, saying, "Be your own man." I don't, I don't think, though, that he was trying to lead him down the path of taking over the mantle. I think he knew that Dick would feel a responsibility as the eldest son to do that, and he was trying to say, I respect what you've done as Nightwing. Kind of what we saw in the Tomasi run, yeah. where they had those great right. moments together, and I think he really was trying to tell him, stay as Nightwing. I think what's going to be interesting to me, and it goes a little bit into where what I'm hoping happens out of the two of them, how is Bruce going to react when he's going to see, in Prodigal, the story that we were referencing before, Dick didn't make Batman his own. Bruce asked him to fill in, and he was really just trying to pretend to be Bruce. And it went horribly wrong with certain people, like Commissioner Gordon and stuff like that. Uh, in this particular case, it's Gordon knew that this was clearly not Bruce, but also recognize the fact that this guy was completely taking over for Bruce. There was a familiarity that Gordon felt there, knowing that I think Gordon knew all along this was a one of the this was Nightwing that was in there. And I think that this type of relationship, I'm very curious to see the conversation between Bruce and Dick because of this. And it was something in this film. I, one of the things I really loved about this film is it feels very contemporary. It feels very now. It was a good choice to pull this story because it was so recent, in the sense that anybody reading the comics, I think, can geek out because this feels very much like the Batman we're currently reading. Yet it's accessible for people who, like my wife, completely understood the story. She's not reading the comics at all. Her exposure to Batman has been clearly through the media. And the mm -hmm. fact that her husband won't shut up, but I mean, it's but I mean, I don't go into the whole like this history continuity discussion we're having right now. She doesn't know any of this. I haven't, you know, done any of that to her. Um, that's not the way you want to experience Batman's continuity. You want to read it. So I mean, that's one of the things that I like about this film is the fact that I think emotionally you can connect to this family, this dysfunctional family that's there, and that's another area where where does superhero comics work? Every family has certain elements of dysfunction. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Very, they could be very minor. They can be huge. But that's something we can all relate to. And what you're seeing here is a family. Yes, it's extreme cases. But one of the best things about fiction is they can go to extreme places that we can't as people. And they help you to feel better about your situation because you can say, geez, at least I'm not there. <laughs> you know, I mean, and that, that is something comforting. So when I see these articles saying that superhero comics are, you know, bad because they teach kids violence, and violence no, it, it, you're missing the whole point of this. This isn't teaching them to be violent. This, this clearly taught people, for example, not to do that. And mm -hmm. because it's the easy way out and because you're better than that and there is something more there. I want to one segment. I want to make sure, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to forget to mention this. This whole ending sequence with the two of them in there, where it was the psychological battle between Jason and Bruce for victory. The Joker was watching all of this and laughing at the whole thing. 
But when the bomb went off there, I loved the fact that he was content to blow up all three of them so neither of them would get what they wanted. Right. Bruce wanted to prove to Jason that his way was the right way. Jason wanted to prove to Bruce that his way was the right way, to the point he set up the two guns and everything in an attempt to have Bruce shoot the Joker or to shoot him in whatever case to make Bruce make a choice there. Bruce, one of the things I love is I love that Bruce has more of an alphabet than A and B because I think that's also a message mm-hmm. that uh, people need to walk away from. But the Joker was so dead on to who the Joker is there, it would be preferential to him. And, and what a great final joke that would be. I destroyed these two, and myself, sure, before either of them could win. Neither of them would ever know who would win, who would convince who. That would be something I would take away from them, and that's funny to me. I love that because it's a small, tiny part of the whole thing, but it, it showed what an agent of chaos that guy is. That, to him, it's never about resolution. It's always about, what can I do to disrupt the peace? What can I do to destroy the, those little powerful moments? And I loved the Joker. We talked earlier about the voice actors. He, That actor was so dead on there with his portrayal of this character and how that worked out because... It it added something to that sequence that uh, you aren't going to get anywhere else except when the Joker's in the middle of it. Sure, John DiMaggio was the was the voice, and mm. you're right. I mean, if you look at Bruce and Jason are having this intense emotional back and forth, and then you you hear the Joker put in these comments down here. He goes, "Oh, you know, the kid's got a point. He came back all the way from the grave just to just to, for he had this party to show up and." Let's take pictures. Who's got the Polaroid? You know, first me and the kid, and then me and you, and then and then the one with the crowbar. And then Jason slaps him down. It's like no cake for you. And it, it they're little things. And when Bruce is talking about how he thinks about killing Joker, and he's like, oh, you do care. And it, it, these little moments that they're, he's trying to egg him on. And and then when he's like, I'll take it all out. And it, it's just. He wants to throw, you know. He he's he's the wrench that that you you just don't. He's the X factor, and he wants everything to go kablooey and you know have er- cake on everyone's face. And I think it's just one of the reasons why the Joker is such an iconic character and has lasted for so long because he takes that he he takes he, he goes to that that le- you know that that edge and it just leaps off it. When it comes to sanity, and it makes for great stories. One of the things that uh, there's two, actually two things that I definitely want to make sure we touch on. First one is the music. It's uh, Christopher Drake did the musical score on this, and one of the things I loved about it is it felt very much like it nodded to the most recent Batman films, the previous Batman films, and animated series while at the same time having its own unique flavor. I really enjoyed the fact that it felt very Batman. It and felt epic. Yeah, really. yeah. Yes, but absolutely. Tons of nods, I felt, to what we've already heard previously without, like, stealing from it, if that makes sense. it was and That's right. very hard to do for somebody to create a score that's original, yet feels thematically like you could put it on a playlist of Batman music and you would be like... Is, was that part of that movie, or was it part of something else? And I like that. I, I really loved the way that this was scored, and how much it's. It's funny how there's a def, there's a definite Batman sound that's out there now, and this was part of it. Absolutely, and I think it it starts it started basically with the Tim Burton Danny Elfman music, and it yes. went forward into like you know the Dark Knight, and then the Batman the animated series, and this the music is just one extra layer to everything else that made this such a great movie in that, you know, you can hear the Tim Burton era stuff. You can hear the, the Dark Knight stuff and you can hear the, the Batman the Animated Series. It, it's all there and yet it has its own flavor. Sort of like how, like, if you ever watched Star Wars or Clone Wars, like the, the main end, the main theme is definitely Star Wars, but it, they, they tweak it just enough to make it their own. And that's definitely what you have here with the music. It's you hear bits and pieces from everything else, but it's its own flavor, and that's what makes it um, it's Batman. You know, for this particular movie, the current Doctor Who series is a great example of that. With each of the different actors that have played in the in the new version, there's been different tones and changes in the 
the music that's used not only in the theme, but also used throughout the episodes that are mm-hmm. unique to if it's Christopher Eccleston or if it's you know Matt Smith or you know straight at David Tennant. Each one of those eras had music that you could define as linking to those specific actors, and I think yet it all felt Doctor Who. So it, it kind of goes along with what you're saying here. The other character that I really wanted to talk about that we've only glossed over, but it really is pivotal to Jason's goal to control crime, was Black Mask. We haven't really talked a lot about the character, and I, I thought that was a character who added a lot to the film. Because you saw him in this situation, you've, he's got this major threat that's coming in. Yet he can't show his underlings at any point in time that he's any less powerful, he's any less in control. The punching that he's doing of people that were there, the way that he's showing that he is tough, he's in control, and this guy's not going to throw him, he's trying to kill this guy, specifically because I think Black Mask knew all along he was a major threat. This guy's coming in under the radar, and the more that was happening to him, the more he was seeing that threat, to the point where he's willing to go to the Joker. You know, to be able to do that, to go to the Joker, you know, this chaotic freak, and put yourself in a position where he's going to throw you, your former associates, into an armored car, and your secretary, and dump all kinds of gasoline all over you, and and really was prepared to light you, and not prepared, he did, he did. light you on fire. Uh, you know, that's that's a dangerous thing. But he, he led to so many moments where I thought, first of all, they nailed the character, and they, they nailed this crime boss who, while he seems all-powerful, uh, clearly has a lot of fear and knows that if he shows any humanity, shows any sign of weakness, his tower that he's built is going to crumble. And I love that he was so outwardly aggressive, because that would be something you'd have to do and you'd have to maintain, or you'd lose that grip. Because anybody who's under him, Anybody who's associated with him, anybody who's partnered with him, is going to be looking for any possible chink in his armor to drive a sword straight on through. And that's why he could never let that show. And I loved that about the character. Was It really shows the depth that these characters have been developed over their years in comics, because Black Mask has become a character that I think is very interesting. It really shows you the, the strengths and weaknesses of these people in crime. And, and what they do, and I thought that was well done. <laughs> and you got that great bazooka segment, which yes. showed the humor still of Jason Todd. Because mm-hmm. this guy, we saw in the sequences that he did joke around. He did have the tongue-in-cheek one-liners. They were they were of a different kind of edge than Dick Grayson's. But he rattled that out, and uh, boy, that guy can really run. You know, it was something like that when he was running through. And I loved that because I was just chuckling all the way through. Yet I never lost the same feel that I had for Jason Todd in those moments. It was a quick one. It felt like something out of an action, from an action movie bad guy. It did, yeah. And it just, it was so brilliantly played. It's funny, but his sense of humor is closer to the Jokers Mm -hmm. than it is anyone, anybody else in the group, in the story. Like, he cut off people's heads to make a point and dropped it on the table and made a joke about it. So... It's funny how Jason hates the Joker so much, but he's more like the Joker in in a lot of ways than he wants to probably that he would ever want to to admit to anybody. But it's important we see that because it adds validity to Bruce's argument right. about crossing the line. Look what happened to Jason when he started crossing the line. He became more like the enemy he was saying we should kill. Mm-hmm. And I think that's it's the funny part when you know, you see the interviews with Judd Winnick, and he's talking about, I didn't expect people to connect with him because I truly see this guy as a villain, and right. people want him to be, you know, uh, like an anti-hero. That's a, he said, I wasn't going for that with him. He clearly is the villain of this story. I think that is where it's really phoned in that he is the villain in this story. What well, was interesting is that when you look at the at first scene, is like, you know, he he. Maybe in a way he's trying to rationalize, rationalize himself. You know, he's like he's got all the heads of of the lieutenants in there, and he's like, you know, you're going to kick forty percent up of your of your uh, profits to me, which you know he's he's becoming the crime lord. But you're not going to you're not going to deal the children. You right. know, children are off limits. And 
Uh, he's like, if you deal with children, you're dead. And then you're like, oh, well, you know, he, he doesn't want them to deal with children. And so he's got that moralistic code there. But if he does, if they do, he's going to kill them, which brings him back to that, that edge again. And I, he's trying to, I think, rationalize everything. This is why this has to be done. And But with Black Mask, I, every time I watched the movie, I, I felt differently about the character because at times I almost felt a bit like – I couldn't take him seriously because he was so out of control and trying to keep things in control and punching out the guys, his guys, but in a way to keep him in line. It, it, I don't know. So sometimes it worked for me. Sometimes it didn't work for me. I, I, I had trouble taking the character seriously all the time, but maybe well, a lot of people too. didn't like that character when they brought him back. Or it was during the Willingham. I think Ru Baker was just leaving the book around that time. They pretty much made they took a, a thug and made him into uh, like a Scarface type of character. Like there were so <laughs> many stories where Batman actually couldn't take him down because he couldn't get the evidence or whatever to take him down. And I was one of the people that were like, I don't remember him ever being that smart. But couldn't you like? Couldn't that be something that happens over time? Because I mean, th- there are thugs who rise up through the ranks. And through observation and just watching from behind, you kind of grow into that position. Jim, you have something it, you want to the say? Greatest, the greatest criminal educational tool is called jail. You know, one yeah. of the things that you, know, you see this in, the re- this is in the real world going on. When a guy gets busted in jail, they're sitting around, usually depending on, typically you have like the white-collar crimes together with the white-collar crimes, and these guys are sitting around, they have nothing to do but talk, and so they'll start talking about what they did, hey, what do you get covered, oh, hey, don't do that, do it this way, and they will share tips on how to get, you know, how not to get caught next time, hey, talk to so-and-so, this is my buddy, he can hook you up with better IDs, I'll go to this guy, and they will, there's this great inner networking going on inside any and every jail in America, so for me, seeing a thug go from a thug to being a crime boss after time, after getting busted and learning, it's something i would actually i see we see present day now we didn't see now to, just to kind of echo back to what they're saying i agree with you but we didn't see all of that development and that's where it was kind of he was jumped into this role now i that's one of the things where off camera you can yeah. kind of rationalize that which is kind of what i did that's why i agree with you but i also right. agree with them in the sense that we didn't see that developed on the page and if we had seen that developed on the page I think more people would embrace the character in that role. That's a story I would love to see, the way you laid that out, and see that developed over a period of time, Mm -hmm. where then all of a sudden this character, I think he would have even been more powerful and more edgy for readers if he had been developed like that. I want to touch on one thing Jamie said real quick before we walk away just from just because in that particular moment he was talking about how it was it got kind of ridiculous with him at certain points I agree with that there was a certain humor value to him because of it because he was scrambling I thought the scrambling though was because this guy's been so used to being in control for so long that now he's got this threat that is totally throwing him off his game and he's struggling to maintain that control and it's why we saw so much outward reaction but i do agree with you that there i think he was put there jamie to a certain extent to for a little levity okay yeah in a, in a very yeah, in a very yeah. dark film but i mm-hmm. when you were saying that i'm like no i i do see where jamie's coming from in there because i agree there was certain levity to him and there are certain parts where he is being over the top but i took the being over the top as something natural but Yet I agree with you that he was behaving in a very ridiculous manner. So you're a hundred percent like the comic. Like yes. there were a lot of scenes throughout, even before the the Red Hood um, came into the story. Just just that developing that world, he came into it and he was very Tony Soprano, and then he would switch into Scarface over yeah, the top. This is what I I thought of. Yes. Yeah, and you see a lot of it in like. The secretary is like, yes, yes, you know, this is mm-hmm. that, this is this, and and you see him like w- at one point when they leave, and you see like the thug and the and the secretary kind of look at each other and like let out a sigh of relief, like, oh god, finally gone, no one's going to get hit again, and it's just, I, I can see what you're saying though, he he was slowly losing control of the situation, and that in itself was making him livid and act the way he was. At, at times, I, I I have a long experience with Batman, and yet for some reason my experience with 
Black Mask is a little bit limited, but I always remember that this the one issue where he supposedly killed you know Stephanie Brown, and I, I got a much more sinister character from that than I really did from anything I saw in the movie. Well, and see, I actually. And I agree with you on that. One of the because th- Jason, if you think about it, made this move very quickly. So I, I didn't take it as he was this all powerful crime boss. I took it as at this particular point in time, there was no real opposition to step up to him. Nobody that was really going for what Black Mask was doing, because mm-hmm. the type of control he was going for at this time, because it's a different Black Mask than we've seen in the recent comics, didn't affect people like the penguin or the joker especially the joker like the joker doesn't care about this it's not his mo uh it's not his so black mask was able to get away with this kind of stuff but when jason todd comes in that's particularly because of the fact that the drug dealers would of course and it was touching on the contemporary thing that drug dealers dealing to kids and getting them involved and things like that this was something where it, it served as a story tool to show that jason todd has a very has a moral code, but it's a very twisted sense of morality, and I think that was part of the point with Black Mask. I do agree with you on the humor value, though, to him, and that he did get ridiculous and over the top. And that I I don't think that's really odd with Bat villains that are like Black Mask in the sense that you know Joker's thugs. Sometimes you'll see them have these little moments and things like that where. You know, they'll, one of them will make a comment, and the others will be like, "Dude, I, you want to keep your mouth shut because <laughs> yeah, Joker, yeah. Joker's going to off you or that type of thing." I agree with it. Like the punching that he was doing was just plain ridiculous. Uh, it was over the top and all that. But I took that as an overly aggressive way to maintain control. I took it as he was very prone to do that anytime anyone spoke up because it didn't matter in his eyes. It, they, none of them should have the opportunity to say anything, because if they do, the other guys might get the idea that they're a little smarter than Black Mask. <laughs> I think I think working for Black Mask probably has the worst benefits ever. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, and I, I guess you were saying, you know, he needed to show that he was in complete control and that no one should even question his plans and his way he should do things i just thought sometimes the 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 severity of of the scene like it just seemed lessened to me at times it wasn't bad and and i liked the use of black mask and and how they used him and i and i did love the scene where you know he he sees uh jason todd he's like waving to him with the bazooka and and the whole line with you know he can he can move fast if he wants to and that sort of thing and it it was good I, i i guess i was just looking for a bit more of a serious type of crime boss than than what we and got I th- all the time. I, I think why they didn't go too much that route, though, is to add balance to an already very dark situation. Because you got the Joker, who usually is the source of major levity. Now, the, granted, the Joker was throwing out jokes, but he was so dark and sinister in this that a lot of his jokes, while they were funny and chuckle moments, you aren't going to start like feeling a lot of levity from this Joker. Because I, I do agree with the comparisons to a little bit more of the Heath Ledger Joker that we've seen than um, to the Mark Hamill Joker, for example. Where the Mark Hamill Joker feels like very much a very strong villain, but there's definitely levity when that guy came on screen. Um, it's particularly in Batman the Animated Series. Jason has some joking moments. Dick Grayson is definitely there for some levity, but again, he's a serious character. So there had to be something in this film that would add a little bit of levity without losing the tone that mm-hmm. this is a crime lord that he's taking down. And I took it as that's what they were going for. Because I did feel this film had a nice amount of balance where I didn't walk away afterwards feeling depressed or down in the dumps, which when you're dealing with deep topics like what they're going through the psychological drama topics that are going through with Bruce and Jason you could really be left in a very bad place after watching this film if there weren't some balance in place and I do think that's what they were going for there and I guess the only reason why I'm even making that point is is to say that I'm not taking anything away from what you're saying there Jamie I, I can see where you're saying the character was a bit over the top I think that was done for a storytelling purpose, though, that I think fitted to add balance. For me, 
Because my experience with Black Mask is kind of limited. I really took him as just a comical element to exactly what you're saying, just to kind of lighten the mode, the mood, but not completely take take us out of the story. You know, this was just this crime boss who was losing everything quickly, who didn't know how to who didn't know how to deal with it. He didn't have a. You know, this is a guy who doesn't have like the you know the the people skills exactly on how to positively deal with a negative situation. So he's just lashing out. But it, I really took it as a levity moment, just so you know the people watching it didn't get too far down in the dumps. But like Jamie said, depending, it's I think it's something where we're all right. Uh, like what Jamie was saying earlier, I think when you watch this film multiple times, which you ha- we all have, I think depending on where you're focusing when you're watching it, you're going to see things a little differently because your focus may be more keyed into that particular sequence or following that particular character. And that's kind of the fun thing about, re- very similar when we talk about rereading comics on the show, rewatching films, not just animated films or comic films, I, I get the same thing when I watch films in general. Uh, it's fun to rewatch a movie and kind of see it from a different perspective or focus on a different thing. And this is a great example of where watching this again, maybe based on Jamie's comments, I might look at Black Mask a little differently because of it, because now I've got something you know that I'm going to focus on a little bit differently. It's interesting. Upon constant review, and I, I think I've seen this like five or six times, and I watched it in, in different... I've also watched it in different aspects. I've, I've watched it while I was working out. I've watched it when... You know, just before bed, I've watched it, you know, when I'm all awake and, and have, like, you know, food. And I've noticed what, each time I've watched it, I I focus on, on different things. It's sort of like when you read a comic book, you know, you, when you read it the first time, you're reading, you're going through the whole thing, and then you read it again. And after knowing the, the book, you you maybe latch on to something that you, you missed the first time around. And, you know, that's why I was, you know, in, in uh, constant viewing, there were times where I would listen to a Joker line, I'm like, I wonder how Mark Hamill would have done that boy, you know, that particular line, because I bet it would have been really cool, of it, or how it would have been done if it was done this way, and that's, I think, the the added bonus in rewatching something after having, you know, knowing what's going to come, seeing it from a different point of view, because I've always, I, I, I see Black Mask in each viewing a little bit differently, and sometimes I like it, Sometimes I don't. It really, you know, it, it could depend on on my mood. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm I watch it and it's like it fits the movie. And sometimes I'm like, maybe I'm tired and I, I watched it and I'm like, uh, yeah, I didn't really like it as much as I when I saw it the third time. But it's that it's the mindset you are when in when you watch the movie. It's maybe the third time you watched it, it, you you get something different. I think each time you see it and. That's one of the beauties about this particular movie because I'm ready to watch it again. I mean, I've seen it five or six times, and I'm and I, I'm I'm ready to watch this like you know seventh, eighth time. It, it's just that great, guys. Um, I'm looking on eBay right now, mm-hmm. and there's a pair of uh, pixie boots that are for sale. The seller does mention that they are magic <laughs> and known to vanish like good pixie boots should in life or death situations. The only drawback is that they don't they aren't guaranteed to take the person wearing them along for the ride. So um, I don't know if you guys are interested in that. They're two ninety nine ninety nine. Buy it now. <laughs> I already own them. <laughs> Any blood stains? You know, explosion? <laughs> no, because they got away before all that. Yeah. <laughs> Cleanest boots ever. Uh, Guys, is there anything else you want to, either of you want to mention about the film that we didn't get to? Daryl, is there anything that, uh, you, you, there's something you wanted to say or anything about the film that uh, we kind of uh, covered a lot? <laughs> yeah, I think we kind of we kind of get into it. I mean, all I, I just like, well, one thing I did, uh, also the hand-to-hand fighting. Yeah. Like, I don't think I've ever seen, besides um, anime type of animation, I don't think I've ever seen for Amer- American um Animation, especially the superhero ones, from the Justice League on to now, I've never seen the the fights that well choreographed. Yeah, the fighting the, scenes were amazing. I especially, yeah. I'm I'm thinking like the last fight too with um, where they're fighting in the bathroom and Jason's head hits the the sink and then the toilet and he goes through the wall and the the fight scenes were done so well and like again, I mean. I mean I can go on and on saying how much I think each movie has improved upon itself. I mean, you know, I've loved all the movies. I mean, DC is my is my my thing, and and so anything DC is 
going to be something that I love. But I think somehow they they're they're able to to top themselves, and the fighting in this was fantastic. It was really well done, really well choreographed. Felt like it could have been like you know a martial you know, like a real martial art type movie. The porcelain breaking in the bathroom, the amount of the tub, the toilet, the sink. Even the tile on the walls as they were throwing punches and stuff like that really added the sense of force that they were using. The fact that these guys were obviously wearing the same battle armor suits that they normally wear into battle, but just showing the sheer amount of force because the Jason's a guy who they talked about earlier. He was using so much excessive force that he broke a villain's collarbone. Mm-hmm, uh, yep. you know, and, and those were sequences where Bruce was talking him down. But these two going full at it, full on, uh, knowing what they do, we got to see the kind of damage they can really cause with their punches and things like that. And I thought that was really one of the things that worked about uh, that fight sequence. And, and you're right, the whole film had just wonderful, even the Amazo fight, you go all the way through, throughout the film, the chase scenes, everything, wonderful choreography of action sequences. The and, scene where he punched, when, when he told Jason, you will never be better than me, when he punched him yeah. through that wall. Yeah. I felt the anger that Batman had. Like, why yes. couldn't you have done better? Like, I, you know, all the things I put in you, all the, the rules, the skills, and this is what you do with it, being a petty criminal. You can, just from that hit, you can you can just feel the anger from Batman. Yeah, and I loved how, like, when you, like, the two flashbacks with, with Robin, when you see the first flashback with the younger Robin and how, Laid on his feet he is, and he throws the marbles, and you know he he's not punching hard, but he's doing a lot. I think a little more kicking, and he's loved how that looked as opposed. And then you go into when he's older, and you know he's, he's breaking the collarbone from from the thug, and it's more hard. He's harder, and he's he has less tolerance over this sort of thing. And it that was just one of many scenes that just looked incredible. I mean, and. Everything about that, from the artwork to the movement, it was just, it was outstanding. Jamie, I know you've got a blog that you did about this particular film. I, I do a blog, it's semi regular, uh, whenever I have a chance. It's called Random Fandom, and it's, uh, I think it's jd74wordpress.com. Uh, what I do basically is, I mean, I love, uh, there's a lot of things about fandom that I love, where it's movies, comic books movies based on comic books i do reviews on them I, i've done some comic book reviews like i did i'll do a random issue that i like like i did nightwing 75 because i just thought it was a great issue i actually did a blog about podcasts that i like too and i know I, I think i listed you guys as one of them i did a review on this movie and you know i just you guys can find that there and it's you know it's something that i like to do i like to dabble in And there'll be links right in the show notes to that, and it'll be on our website as well, obviously. So um, feel free to either write it down or just click right on it from our website. And Daryl, what's coming up on your podcasts? We've uh, Um, definitely had you on the show before, and if our listeners aren't listening now, they better be. (laughs) We did the the web comics, and I I just put that episode up yesterday. and It had uh, Zach Krusey, who does uh, Mystery Solved, and uh, Sean Pryor, who you go to PK Media... PKD Media, and he does a whole bunch of web comics, like Mercury and the Merv, and uh, and it's, it's a list of, of of good stories that he does. That was the last one. I did a couple of ones where I interviewed like Joe Caramagna, I interviewed Jimmy Palmiotti. I had a just a, I've gotten a few interviews here and there, and and what's coming up is I'm going to do start interviewing podcasters that of podcasts that I like to listen to. So Sean and Jim will be on one of those shows coming up, I hope. <laughs> oh, yeah. I already told you yes to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, that that's it. I mean, I'm just, it's basically, I'm having a good time uh, with Comic Book Road Show trying to, you know, really get into doing different things. I mean, the model has been set from um, Comic Geek Speak, where you, how they pretty much celebrate comics, movies, and all that. And, I, you know, I'm into that, too. So it's just my way of, you know, doing that. And plus, Laurie should be back on the show in a couple of weeks. So I'll have Laurie back as a... Because she started it all, so she'll be back on the show. And no apologies, same deal. We Every week we get together on Skype and, and we just talk movies, TV, whatever crazy thing we think of at the time. 
or depending on how drunk we get. <laughs> so, now, now when you first. Yeah, right. And to fix this hideout, that's just well, we start out with good topics, and then some of us mess it up. I'm namely one of them because we get off topic very often, but we we all have a good time on the Fixers Hideout. So you can go to thefixers.com and you can listen to some of the uh, the earlier ones, or you can go to Facebook, and we have a Facebook page. We put up the episodes all on the Facebook page, so you can check them out and, and listen to the different uh, episodes that we've done so far. And your Comic Book Roadshow site? Right. Uh, it's um, Comic Book Roadshow and No Apologies dot wordpress dot com okay. and you can catch both shows talking about both shows now when you have us on your show are you going to want to have the sensei what not jim segulin or james segulin which one of me do you want to show up i'll answer that i for want you. both of them <laughs> all. No, i'll answer that for you. you're going to want a mute button <laughs> it's a wonderful tool you just press it and then you don't hear anything then you let him do his own little thing <laughs> and you can even sing the intro that I'll play in the beginning of the episode. Oh, Ooh. I was asking for trouble. <laughs> Did I mention I'm busy that day? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> and it's whatever day fun. that is, he has I'm a busy. The doctor's appointment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the doctor's appointment's been planned out for months, and it's whatever day that is. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, I want to thank both of you for joining us on this particular segment. Batman has been my lead character for my entire life. I mean, it was the first superhero that I just really latched on to. I've, I've never let go of that passion for this character. And to see these movies developed, and just to see this character continue to evolve and continue to be contemporary and interesting is something for me that's a pure joy. And it's a strength, actually, of the comic book medium and of the creators that are working with this character, that they're finding new and unique ways to take Bruce Wayne mm-hmm. and continue to evolve this character and make him contemporary as times change. I mean, you know, for me, it's been 70s, 80s, 90s, and now into the 2000s. You know, this is a character I've been reading for almost, uh, you know, 35 years now. And, yeah, same yeah. here. Yeah, and, and yeah. You know, no change. It's, yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I, I started reading these comics with my uncles, and, you know, so I... Been, you know, the comic books I read with him were like you know in the '60s going forward, and it's amazing how the, the writers, you know, past, present, and are able to do something new with the character and yet still keep him at its core who Batman is. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's as iconic as he is, because no matter what era it is. He, he stole the character that people always remember him. Whoever ever age group, he's still sort of in that same core character. And you always find new and interesting things about that character. And I think that's why he's always been and I think probably will remain a, a fan favorite. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Holy caffeine! Jim, our next episode, we're going to wrap up this discussion. We're going to talk about the Jonah Hex and the DVD extras that were on this. We're also going to do, it's going to be a little bit of a shorter one. We're going to have some Speeding Bullets styles, look at some of the new books that are coming out. That episode's going to be followed by a Gail Simone Spotlight episode. We're going to take a look at Secret Six, Welcome to Tranquility, and of course, Birds of Prey. So uh, we're going to have kind of a spotlight. And we're going to do those quarterly. I'd like to do quarterly, just pick a writer or an artist and spotlight some of their work and pick, you know, single issues of uh, various titles that that person's working on and really kind of spotlight what we're enjoying about them. And I'd like to make that kind of a quarterly feature about the show. So we'll do that. And then we're going to go to Batman the Cult. So we're getting there, Jim. The Cult's on the horizon, finally. We have not forgotten (laughs) about it. No, I'm really excited to chat about that one. Our sponsors for this episode are DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, Batman the Hidden Treasure number one, regularly $4.99, 40% off only $2.99. And that, when they get into like the $4.99 price point and stuff like that, really helpful to be using DCBService.com because that shaves off a good couple bucks off of the whole process, which is always nice. Over at InStockTrades.com, I want to remind everyone, as we mentioned, Batman the Cult, only a few episodes till that. Finally, we're going to be discussing regularly $19.99, 47% off, only ten fifty nine. Batman Deacon Blackfire from 89, that four-issue miniseries, which is like, it's really like eight issues when you get down to the sheer number of pages. I forgot the density of the dialogue in that. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a very dense read, so that's InStockTrades.com, Batman the Cult. And, Jim, I want to remind everyone that ComicCollectorLive.com is 
your comic book management source. And that's a wonderful website. If you haven't been checking that one out, it's a great way to manage your comic collection. They even have a feature where there's a iPad or iPhone app, you know, it's whatever, any of those uh, devices you can download. And actually, it'll have the newest comics and variants every Wednesday. So if you want to make up a wish list when you're going to the comic shop, that's a great way to do it to make sure you're getting all those titles. Or if there's something that's not on the shelf that you were looking for, maybe the shop sold out for, you'll have that on your list so you can let the shop know to, hey, reorder that. So it's a great way if you're going into your comic book shop weekly to let them know what books you're interested in looking for that maybe uh, you're missing. So it's kind of cool. That's ComicCollectorLive.com. I want to remind everybody about the Hero Initiative. It's HeroInitiative.org. And be sure to check that one out. Uh, I always tell people the price of a comic book. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful way to support that. I signed up this year as a member. Uh, which is something, it's the first year that I've done it, and it's something I'm going to keep doing from here on out because I'm a big believer in the cause. I think it's a wonderful way to give back to this industry. You know, for me, it's been over 35 years of my life I've been reading comic books, and this has given me so much entertainment, so much joy, such an escape from, like, you know, the tough things in life that I really am a big believer in supporting the cause of the Hero Initiative, so I really urge you to do the same. Want to remind everyone, you can also hear us weekly on Get Your Geek on Radio. GetYourGeekOnRadio.com, an online radio station committed to making geek chic. And Jim, we will see everyone next week. Bye! In a lot of different, there's a couple different moments in, um... What the heck is going on out there? <laughs> Someone drag racing. The Terminator's coming. What are they doing out there? <laughs> Sky Nexus found you. Run. I think it's a Batmobile. Run. Okay, I, I don't know why I'm recording this, but I some, for some reason I need to. You said you were singing at work and you were asked to stop, but I, I'm going to... Let's forget jumping to all that. Why were you singing at work? Oh. <laughs> well, one, at work we have fun. It's, you know, probably the most unprofessional... Pro- professional environment so we kind of have fun and it was somebody and i can't even remember what the song was but they threw out a line of a song and so i just sang it and you know i'm like then i said don't worry i'm gonna stop singing now and i hear good from like a kibble cubes <laughs> over <laughs> hey come on yeah you, know, you gotta have fun you gotta life you know rule number 31 enjoy the little things wow. whose rules are those zombie land <laughs> Zombie Land. Uh, That's like my new favorite movie right now. I've seen it like about half a dozen times. You know, I have to still see that movie. I haven't seen it yet. I, I've heard nothing but good things about it, though. It's funny. Man, it, it's one of those, I. it has some classic zombie elements to it, but it doesn't just like hold solid to it. It's still a very solid comedy with some of these you know, little zombie moments that I was just like, oh, that's a classic zombie moment. Cool. But I was laughing my head off throughout the movie. Isn't Bill Murray in that? Yes, Isn't Bill Murray. Canada? Bill Murray is absolutely hysterical in the movie. I've, I haven't laughed that. I he just had me. I was on the floor with his whole involvement in the movie and what he did and whatnot. You know, so it was a, just a very outstanding moment. Okay, because I, I I've seen a bunch of interviews with him and they talk about Zombieland and just how classic his role was in it. So I'm like. After hearing that, I, every time I see something and Bill Murray's in it, I have to see it. It's like all my list of things to see. It's only two seconds, but he's in it. Yeah. <laughs> he's only in it for like two two seconds. I went to the bathroom when I first saw it and missed that whole scene when I came back. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's really short then. Yes, very short. Daryl, can mm-hmm. you up your, your uh, volume a little bit? Yeah, hold on. Just, I want to balance you out so we don't lose you. Jamie, you're fine. Okay, cool. How about now? You sound good. Okay. Say sh- she sells she. <laughs> Can't even say it. Forget it. Say it. <laughs> she sells. She sells by the seashore. Yeah, you sound good. That's good. All right, that's perfect. I wanted to make sure we had you. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> At least you know how to say it. 